Welcome to the Institute of Natural Philosophy. You're with me, Phil, from the Ancient Alternative View. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. Today, I welcome Fozzy the Aussie, an old friend of mine. He has journeyed through India, as you all know, one of my favourite places to study with the ancient hallmarks. For more on the hallmarks, we'll leave a link in the video where you can go to academia.edu and see the SOS for yourself where it's doing extremely well. Anyway, I'd like to welcome Fozzy on the show. Fozzy, would you like to give us a brief description of yourself and what your aims and what you do and what you've been doing in India for us, please? Good, good evening. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, for having me. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity, first and foremost, to sort of get this out there because it's been something that I've been really interested in for, you know, a considerable amount of time. I just didn't think it would be something that would ever sort of, I guess, come to fruition. But, you know, I guess you wish hard enough and, you know, you do the right thing and eventually these things sort of manifest themselves. But, um, yeah, I've been living in India for about seven months now in total. Um, you know, I, I run a business. Um, I don't really need to get in that. It's generally on the exporting, you know, sort of side of things, certain powders and whatnot. Uh, but in terms of my deep passion, which is obviously what we're going to discuss today, um, is in the sort of, you know, the ballpark of ancient history and, you know, my sort of beliefs on how old a lot of these structures are in India um, and my beliefs that, you know, they are significantly older. Um, what else about myself? I guess I'm a little bit of an intrepid explorer in some ways. I let my mind sort of get the best of me in other ways and think about, you know, maybe think about the way things should have intended to be, especially when we look at, you know, ancient history, when we look at the ancient architectural structures and how things sort of operated, you know, especially when we look at the sort of extremes of what some people might see as conspiracy theory. But when it comes to the nature of energy generation in its various forms, um, you know, I'm sure some of your fans are biting at the biting at the bone when it comes to the thoughts about like what the pyramids were or what they were intended to be, you know, stuff like that, or Machu Picchu in South America, all these ancient sites, places in Turkey, and of course India. Um, you know, and I've spent quite a considerable amount of time at some of these cave sites. Um, admittedly, I haven't been to every single one. It's well and truly over a thousand just submitted across central India. I've only been to a fraction of that so far. Um, but in my journeys to these places, and I've done videos and of course I've loaded some stuff up onto YouTube and, you know, the sort of photography of it all is pretty average, but there was a lot that I captured, which was very interesting. So like some of the acoustic properties of these caves, um, the electromagnetic alignments, um, of some of these structures and of course the hydrology and the mineral composites that there is so like all these sites you know naturally they've got basalt granite and quartz which was a bit of a shocker to me you know because you don't really notice the quartz until you're up close it's kind of hard to gauge what the type of mineral compositions are um, until you're actually at the sites themselves and they are monumental they are incredible and awesome. absolutely huge, huge starting oh, point man. from from there to initially start discussing one of uh, my favourite aspects at the moment within research is the archaeoacoustic properties of some of these sites. And in India, I know that you know that many of these temples seem to have been built with archaeoacoustic properties in mind right from the start. Now, globally, we see other temples similar like the Maltese Hypergeum Cephalini. A uh, hypergeum is an underground aquifer, for want of a better word, that is allowing water into that temple for a specific purpose. Now, this doesn't just happen in Malta, of course. You you know, and we'll talk about uh, this happens on a, a very large scale in India. And it seems um, I, I've had theories where maybe at some point many of these temples were actually connected by maybe these underground aquifers and they were controlling maybe the amount of water coming into an individual site inclusive of what you were discussing in the mineralogy and whether they all work together to produce specific it, it seems you're not a taboo to say technologies here but if it's something we don't know that they could do then it's a technology that we don't understand they had. So I really like the archaeoacoustic and hydrology properties. What did you come across there 
uh, that was interesting with regards to the hydrology on your on your travels to all the temples. We could we could start with the Kailasa Temple as a as a beginning point if you'd like. I mean, I know you've done multiple, but the Kailasa Temple for me is we discussed this off camera. It's one of the wonders of the world for me. It's absolutely mm. amazing. It's not only a beautiful temple, but it was monolithically built, which means it was built downwards. So in my eyes, the builders weren't only magnificent at what they were doing they were doing it the hardest way possible going downwards so almost backwards in effect so yeah I, what, what were your thoughts on the Kailasa temple and the, the properties and things that were going on there Fuzzy? well the first thing that i noticed almost off the bat about the hydrology aspect is when you actually walk up to the to the main complex so you're coming in from the east direction and you're walking towards the west. So there's a massive green ground out the front. You, there's a massive queue. You pay for your tickets and you start heading up west. When you get to the major the major wall, the major gate at the front of the Kailasa Temple Complex of the Allura Caves, to the, to the right-hand side, so I guess facing north, is a massive underground aquifer that's exposed. Like the, ro the rocks come away. First and foremost, you, there's actually a staircase that allows you to walk down into the water. It's it's right at the top, but that that complex itself, that 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 hypergeum, let's say, it does extend under the caves. Uh, sorry, under the around the northern side of the Kailasa Temple. Now, in that cave system, it extends upwards um, to the roof of the Kailasa complex, and on the northern side of that roof of the complex, where the natural grounds are, where the natural hill is, is actually another temple. That you can actually see right down into this massive body of water and there's bats wow. living in there and stuff like that but that wasn't the only thing that i noticed is there's a massive there's a massive connecting network of i i don't know if they're basalt or they're granite i didn't test but they're plainly there and i know i did put a photo up of it or photos sorry i should say up on my twitter page there's actually like basalt and or granite pipes like plumbing pipes they're actually exposed. They're coming out of the ground, like the like just from natural people being there, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people walking over the ground every single year. It's only natural that dust and dirt will begin to like, you know, sort of move away. And on that northern side, so when you go up around the Kailasa Temple, you can actually see these pipes and they're facing, they're facing, um, they're facing magnetically in well not magnetically but they're facing north south east and west like corresponding to the actual site oh, so wow. there's water coming in and i thought to myself and when i was with my partner her and i were going around and exploring the outer site which is not the kailasa temple itself but the outer site surrounding the, the roof or the, the the top of that hill there's actually a massive enormous rock cut river channel and you can tell that it's rock cut because when you go up into the into the hills where it's completely off the beaten path and you follow this river you can actually see bore drilling that's taken place where they've broken away the rock intentionally to funnel water down into this site and on the both on the on the on the um northern side and on the southern side of the site so when you're looking at the temple it's to the left and to the right from you know sort of looking west there's not just the aquifer on the right hand side there's also an aquifer on the left hand side as well so this channel was intentionally carved to cut to, to channel water all the way down into these reservoirs plus i suspect much like the other caves but i don't know this for certain is like at the other caves there's aquifers these natural aquifers exist inside the hill and they're cutting these builders, whoever designed these places, are intentionally cutting either towards to access that water or utilise the sort of fluidity and the water mechanics to sort of amplify the acoustic properties of some of these cave systems. So that's my suspicion. And as me and my partner walked up into this hill line, we're finding all these all these miniature temples that have been carved out and haven't been completed. Some of them have been covered in with dirt just from natural wind and debris. And they've all got little Shiva lingams in them. Some have got like um, uh, big murals of Brahma, which is one of like the three prime deities. They unfinished, or they could could they have been part of maybe a, a bigger complex that could have been on yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. 
I, I think the entire site, the entire hill line is actually one massive complex. It's covered with dirt, yeah, much like when you look at the well, too. It looks almost like you could yeah. take another layer off and you might get like the hundred percent of the Kailasa temple. No, that's a bold statement. I know it's a huge undertaking. And India is fantastic, let's say, with heritage and looking after their temples. They really are. So um but I would like to see that Fuzzy. I would I would like to see more excavation maybe done in that area. Sorry to cut you off, but I I, I agree with you. I think there's more more to behold, should we say, under there. Yeah. I think the archaeological survey of India is suffering from the same complex that like the Egyptology, the archaeological Egypt Society or whatever their name is, is, is yeah, in, yeah. The, in the same yeah. sort of mental, in that same mental box, like, oh, we can't. And I guess their reasoning for not doing any further excavation, it's only been like sort of the rudimentary looks of why these things haven't happened, but it's mainly of cultural insensitivity, which I understand, but the fact remains, and I know it's just, I know it's coming from me, I guess, as a foreigner living in India, but the fact remains that these sites, I, just by the sheer volume of basalt and granite, just by the sheer properties of the tools that would be required to carve these sites, yeah, understanding the magnetic properties of these sites, you need like a mag, what are they called, magnometers? You need to understand geosurveying. To find those bodies of water, you have to understand the, you have to understand the, the 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 technology essentially behind actually finding underground bodies of water. Of course, and that, it, 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 it isn't just the temple that we're looking at in its finished state. No, 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 no. You have to know the ground to pick, how to start uh, the engineering, the manufacturing, how you get rid of the materials itself. The amount of people, if it was people, I mean, you're talking thousands to get rid of that amount of dirt in the time scale provided unless we're missing something dramatic here you know now water the water the aquifers and um, the archaeoacoustics i believe with like, like similar to yourself that there was a communication system between specific temples i actually think they were linked uh, maybe even now i think some of those links may be broken but in essence, I think a lot of these temples had specific distances and they were linked and you had water. We did a video on the Institute. Uh, there's a map from 13, 1375, don't quote me, but it uh, it's around that period that shows you all across river lines, all the temples very much joined to each other, all across Africa, Egypt, all the way. Basically, the new road, if you get me, from India to Macedonia, it was kind of like that. And we show you the whole map as it goes across and how these temples were using water. You can even see how on some of the temples, they've got three little blue lines. So there was three different water tributaries going into one, aquifers, uh, hypogeums, whatever you might suggest. Then other ones just had one going in. Now, to me, if you were in control of the water systems, like at certain hypogeums, and you were controlling it for a reason. Now, we could surmise that through mineralogy, i.e. the quartz amounts in some of these temples or different mineralogies used. Do you think that could be something that's applicable to maybe how people in India or the ancient Indian builders were building these temples? They must have been looking for, A, the hypogeum properties, the water, then they start their project, so to speak, and th then we see the finished temples, you know? Mm. Um, <clears throat> so I said to you off camera, and I'll go over it again. So there's, uh, from my, this is just my observational sort of experience, but there's two different, there's two different types of, I guess you would say, conventional hydrological construction methods that I've noticed in central India, and that includes the Western side as well. So there's a degree of separation between the understanding of hydrological systems in Gujarat, let's say, which is Western India. It's quite a, it's quite an arid environment um, at, a, I guess, a point in the distant past um, when India, I guess, or Bharat had sort of domain over the Indus Valley, um, you know, in the Indus Valley River, you know, how that all connected into the Himalayas and whatnot, but those valleys have since dried up. So I guess the region of Gujarat's quite arid, but for some reason in Gujarat, there's this, there's this layout that extends for, for 
dozens of kilometres. I know for a fact that one of these sites connects an underground aquifer system through these rock cut channels of basalt and andesite. Um, and some of these areas get into regions where there's a lot of alluvian soil as well, where they connect from these major centres of pilgrimage. So the Jotalings, which are, which are major, major sites in the Hindu religion. Originally, there were 64. Now there's about 12 of them. Um, and there's two in, uh, in Gujarat. There's one in Somnath, um, which is on the southern coast. And there's one in Dwarka, which is on the western coast. So Dwarka is the city where, where Krishna was sort of, um, uh, he had his, like, his, his, like, um, his christening ceremony, essentially. And, but at these sites, and Somnath is a great example of it, is there's this massive rock cut channel that extends not just and originally, and it's still there now, unfortunately, it's been closed up by the Archaeological Survey of India because they've literally packed in concrete and built an entire landmass around the coastal line. Because unfortunately, the southern coast of Gujarat absolutely gets smashed by waves. There's so much, there's so much, there's so much, um, there's so much damage from the ocean currents onto those onto those like um, massive walls that sort of run along the coastline because they're like 10 meters tall and they're just like sheer cutoffs. Like it's not just like a walking down into the beach, getting sand between your toes. It's not like that. It's a real rocky, it's a very rocky coastal region. Um, but under that temple, it connects to a temple within one kilometer of it called the Surya Mandya, which is a, which is a temple um, dedicated to Surya, the sun god, very similar to, I guess you would see in like, you know, whether that's Roman mythology or whichever god represents the sort of sun. Um, but that temple then oh. connects to Junagar. And Junagar is like 50 kilometers northwest. And this underground channel runs all the way to Junagar. And then Junagar is a distribution site of these multiple rock channels that go out into different directions to more places. Now, there's one place in Ahmedabad where I'm located that I'm going to be going to. It's referred to locally as the cellar. I haven't been there yet. I'll be taking footage. No one knows about this place. It's really like, it's really on the down low, but I'll be going to it real soon. I haven't got a specific day, but I'm hoping within the next, within this month, I'll I get to go. I those videos and can I interview you first? Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Um, but then if you look in central India, the, the understanding of hydrology is a little bit different. So these underground aquifers in Gujarat, they, they present themselves as step wells. So everyone knows about all the step wells. There's heaps of step wells across Nasty. Gujarat. Nasty. These are all these Nasty. are all connecting points. These are all connecting points for all these underground rock cut channels. And my my initial thoughts on these is that the ocean water comes in, right? Because Gujarat's quite a dry area, so there needs to be a consistent amount of water. And the alluvian soil that comprises up sections of these underground cut channels actually behaves as a natural filtration system that filters out the salt. And by the time the water reaches the distance of like 60 kilometers inland, Filtered the, out the water's now, correct. So now the water is completely fresh and drinkable. So these are connecting sites all across Gujarat, where in, in Maharashtra, for example, all these, these underground aquifer places where the, well, there's actually two. You've got the on the ground and then you've got up in the mountains. So when you look at like um, in Nasik, for example, which is the first time that I ever got to explore one of these caves, which is called the Pandav Lenny Caves, named after, I guess, the Pandava brothers, which were shown in the Mahabharata to, to go across India and restore a lot of these ancient sites in light of their victory of the war. This site has underground aquifers, not just sitting below the actual temple complexes, but actually behind inside the walls. Wow. So they had a complete wow. understanding of hydrology and it impacts the acoustics in a lot of the rooms. So whether it's in the Chatya halls where the stupas are, like of the cylindrical stupas that have like this almost like reverse step well that looks like an upside down pyramid that's connected to the tops of them, um, or in rooms that have like sculptures of Vishnu or sculptures of Buddha, or sculptures of like the the Jain, the, the the I guess the Jain prophet, but they all seem to represent whether it's Vishnu or Buddha, or I think it's called Tirathanka. They all represent water, and at some of these sites, you also see the fish and the turtle, um, which I believe represents like the first avatar of Vishnu, which is essentially like water. 
So all these sites have a representation in water. They, they're all carved out, I guess, to have this, this effect of not just these chambers where Buddhists would sit in and do mantras and chant and meditate. But I do believe and I do suspect that these had an original purpose and that it's not that those things are necessarily secondary, but I'm sure there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a bleed over of mechanisms, whether one influences the other or the second one influences the first. So whether that is deep chanting that has this weird reverberation effect in the rooms that sit on top of aquifers, mind you, and all of the sites in central India as opposed to, as opposed to Gujarat, what's interesting about them is it's not just having the aquifers and not just having the understanding of where the aquifers are or carving into ridiculously hard rock, whether that's basalt, granite, including including the quartz that's littered through the sites, they're carving the quartz as well. So by default, you need something that's as hard as quartz or harder in order to cut that, which is realistically diamond. <clears throat> But also these sites have actual rock cut channels that flow that seasonal overflow of water to go down into the valleys to fuel agriculture and fuel civilization. So there's almost like a community based effort that involves these sites as well. And these are ridiculously old. Um, and I can talk more about that, but there, there's, there's in my mind, just from some of the observations, there's like three stages. Because just to touch on just where you've got to so far before we continue, mm. it's extremely interesting. This shows such a knowledge of hydrology to an archaeoacoustic property within the temple building initially that, you know, I, I think very purposeful. There was definitely alternate meanings because think about it, the archaeoacoustics in some of the columns in India, in some of these temples, you can actually touch them with your finger, the column, doom, and it will play like a G, doom, C, D, E. And if you had that knowledge, could there be some kind of maybe like hidden frequency that allowed specific communications or messaging throughout these temples? I mean, I specifically think that it seems like we were far cleverer in the designing of these temples then we're surmising what was going on we don't actually know let's make this clear you and i are just theorizing here on what we're seeing in the physical evidence and i, I will add a big thank you to fozzy at this point boots on ground where it goes is where we find the answers and this guy's just spent pretty much seven months of his life studying this subject for us so uh, it, this isn't just us looking at photos on the internet no no this guy is boots on ground in the temples constantly all the time which fascinates me and the institute in, in, in on a whole to experiences of people going on to these sites because you really do need and i speak from experience here to go on a site you need to feel a site not just look at it not just check the mineralogies on the internet you need to check them there you you almost have to you get a feeling on these sites don't you and Sometimes people might say it's a bit weird or esoteric. I'm not actually joking. It's almost like, um, how do I put this? Like a, a feeling of awe, like you're almost like in awe of the site, like, wow. It's like you're wowed by, you, you, you're in a different place to where we build today. We, as, as I said to you off camera, I'm, I'm a helicopter engineer by trade. And I, we could get whatever team we wanted to sat round right now. And where would you begin with a schematic of engineering, manufacturing, and so on, with somewhere like we mentioned earlier, like the Kailasa Temple? I, I think it's such a big undertaking that that's why we don't do anything like that. We simply can't. Now, we obviously could, and the application of this hydrology, archaeoacoustics, it seems in India, and we again discussed this off camera, that India is some kind of global hub to engineering, in my opinion. It's not only ornate, it's got thousands of temples. They didn't just do it once. It's almost like the builders, for want of a better word, and I use this word, word loosely, it's like they were taking the piss, like they knew that much that they were showing us we can do this, we can do that, we can do this, and we can't hope to copy that. Can we, Fuzzy, you know? No, I um, and it's something that I've noticed across these sites, and 
when you spoke earlier about like the acoustic properties and how these things could be used for communication, it's interesting because it reminded me of when I went back to the the Nasik caves or the Panda Pleni, I think there's another name that it goes by as well, but the caves, the Buddhist rock cut caves in Nasik, which funnily enough actually has a, a Hindu lingam in in the midst of construction. Like you can go to one of the cave rooms and there's this lingam there that's it's almost begun. It almost shows you that there was a construction that had begun to build this lingam, but it had never been finished. So that's just why I know that's separate. But when I went back, I went to the first cave out of the 24 caves that there is. Now, this is actually considered to be a cave as opposed to a Chatya hall or a Vamana. So the Chatya halls are where the supas are inside or a big sculpture or big statue of Buddha. And then the Vamanas are what they're seen as like sort of the prayer, the, the prayer halls, oh, sorry, the meditation rooms, the sleeping quarters, that sort of thing. But in the first cave, I used this technique that I used at the Kala Caves last year in Mumbai. And that technique just, it, it randomly came to me out of nowhere. And when I went to the Kala Caves in Mumbai, and this is a massive section of about 110 caves that is north of Mumbai in an area called Borivali, is there's one of these walls outside the Chachi Hall and it didn't really look natural to me. I don't know what it was. It was like the type of rock. And I went up and I pressed my hand against it and something just compelled me to knock it. So I knocked at it and it made a hollow noise. And I'm like, holy fuck. So I started knocking all over the place. Everyone's just looking at this random white guy just knocking on the walls. They're like, what the fuck's this guy doing? <clears throat> and people came up and asked me, and I'm like, guys, listen to this. And I've got footage of this on my YouTube. Like I show some of the people, they'll come up to and I'll knock it. And you can tell that these are hollow. And I'm like, dude, there's geopolymers here. But I took that idea of the knocking when I went back to Nasik, and we could talk about the geopolymers a little bit. I think this is the second dairy stage of the construction or restoration of these sites that probably took place in the Mahabharata. Um, <clears throat> but when I went back to the, to the Pandav Leni caves in Nasik, the first cave room, which has massive bore drill marks that you can see littered around the room and they're as old as the rocks themselves. Like, and you can tell in terms of their degradation, how they're so, and they're so smooth as well. So smooth, dude. Like when you see the videos of the bore drill marks in Egypt, identical in terms of how smooth these bore drill marks are. But on one of the walls, which is the northern wall, I went up and I just pressed my hand against it. I did the same thing and I recorded this and it's up on my Twitter, uh, up on my Twitter profile now, is there's a wall and, and I go up to it and I just knock the rock and it just sounds like as you would knock rock it's quite dense it doesn't really make much of a noise but you can hear that knocking noise and then like 10 centimeters to the right i then knock again and you know what i get ping like full-on metallic yeah full-on dude like there was this weird metallic noise yeah dude i've got it up on my profile i knocked on it and i show you i'm like here knock knock and it's like dun, dun. and then i knock 10 centimeters to the right and it makes this weird vibrational like this weird vibrational like metallic tang when i knock it i'm like dude like i don't know what that is but like there's clearly an understanding of the different rock types that encase this area now on the right side where i was playing on that wall there probably is an aquifer that's on the other side i wouldn't be surprised if that is the case and maybe that point where i was knocking on the wall is is the part where the water gets closest to the wall before you break in. So it's hollow, but it's full of water. So there is this, I guess, this perception that there can definitely be, and and it plays true when you go to places like the Aurangabad Caves in Sambhaji Nagar. It's a place that's sort of, it, it's about, it's about, a hun, it's about 170 kilometers east of Mumbai, a bit southeast in a city called Aurangabad. And there's these caves, the Arangabad caves, that show the most intense, intense archaeoacoustic properties out of any of the caves that I've been to. And wow. me and my partner, we, we walked into one of them, bro. So that you go in and there's this massive central room with Buddha. And then around the central room is this big corridor. And around that corridor is more of these rooms. There's three on the left, three on the right, and then two in the back. And they're exactly the same at all the sites that I've been to. Like the layout is almost identical. And we went into these rooms wow. and, just, and just a whisper, 
just a whisper bro and that sound reverberates and echoes in that room but one of the things that i noticed outside of the acoustic properties which when you're first in there bro like really freaks you out because you feel it in your body like you go oh or you make any sort of noise and you feel that reverberation in the fiber of your being and it gives chills bro it leave chills on the back of my neck but what i noticed secondary to that and this has been at all the all the cave sites including kailasa is there's this black this black pigmentation marking almost like a paste in some respect that is littered all over the rooftops and some of the walls yes. and and some people will say oh that's just like soot that's just soot from burning candles in those rooms over like a thousand years but then you go up and you wipe it there's no soot and it has this glossy finish to it so when i went to nasik i took recording of it i'm just like i haven't posted enough on my twitter yet but i i used my fingernail i chipped away at some of the rock that i could that had black on it and i'm like fuck it may as well see what it tastes like right it could be anything let's just so I popped a, a very small amount in my mouth. I let it like just sit. So it had a bit of a salty, almost like a salty flavor to it. Um, but I don't know what it is, but these are at Nasik, these are at Kailasa, these are at Arla Caves. These are all the cave sites, despite the cave sites. Like, I mean, hundreds of kilometers. Sorry, what was that? Fluids. Oh yeah, Al Aruan, haven't you? And I'm going to so turn into venom in soon, black, bro. The black granite talk. So coffee guy, yeah. Cheers. <laughs> but, like, the, the black goo, the black goo that was reported in Zaya Al Aruan, which is now surrounded by an RAF base, and no one can go to the inverted pyramid at all. It's completely shut off. Yeah, trust me. Um, Dude, so, well, I think that that black substance, whatever it is, I I haven't I taken think, a sample to actually take to it. Be? It sounds silly, like an after effect of the archaeoacoustical properties with the hydrology. Could it have, like, almost like a, 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 a mold, for want of a better word, some kind of like reverberation with water, like, and we can't see it. It's called infrasound. So if we you you get to, you get levels of sound, of course, but if you get like like you said, I felt this like in my chest. And you get this on all uh, when you study the archive acoustics on all sites. People get that feeling of awe or fear everywhere they go when there's a, uh, an acoustic property on a site. You either feel wowed or, oh my God, I've got to get out of here. There's the two thought processes. It's almost how the site was calibrated, if you like. Now, I think if you go there with certain, uh, like say a PC and we use different frequencies, we would be able to actually get these temples to vibrate at an infrasound level. Do you get what I mean? And maybe reproduce some of the archaeoacoustic properties that in ancient times were being used. Do you understand my point? Yeah. yeah. I'll go as far as I, to, you could maybe in Egypt, like say some of these massive rocks, the archaeoacoustic, if you play the frequencies, it could and open them. Could be on like a, an actual uh, a system where the rock would move you understand what i mean simple as that and it might move in and out or backwards or forwards like a door you just simply don't know these archaeoacoustic properties give these temples i mean in india they've done next level things with it which blows my mind like you say it's like you you just can't when you come when you come to india bro we're gonna go to kerala yeah we're gonna go to padamaswami temple I don't know if you've heard of it. No, I'm sure you've heard of it. I've probably so seen the temple. I'm not. Oh, no, this is the it. temple. This is this is the temple that has like the twelve vaults that like only two or one of them have ever been opened, and these vaults oh, are yeah, across yeah, this yeah, temple. Yeah, yeah. They've got the massive doors with the snakes and looks like a big demon head oh, on it and stuff like this, that. Yeah, yeah I, I have a suspicion. I, I have a suspicion, and one day I'd love to be able to test this. And I've already said it to myself. I said if I ever get the opportunity to actually put something into practice and test these methods to open up these doors. I only want 1% of whatever's inside because whatever's 1%, because the first one that was opened, I think well, one was, wasn't one was it, opened. Wasn't it gold and dude, diamonds? There was, and yeah, and dude, there was like $15 trillion or some nonsensical amount like worth of money. I'm like, bro, that's too much for me. Like 1%, I'm sorted. Half of that's going to go like, into restoring the uh, more of these sites anyway. Temples, yeah. I, 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 bro, to me, I would love to reinvigorate 
uh, to me, dude, I would love to reinvigorate these sites to go back to what their original purposes were intended to be. Sure. And we just spoke earlier about this, about this black who is this black substance. <clears throat> I suspect, I suspect, I suspect it is some form of a layering that's been applied. Because if we think about, if we think about, like for example, the compressional wave velocity that we spoke earlier and the sound velocity. So for any people listening, I guess I'll go over it sort of briefly. So acoustic velocity or sound velocity, people just imagine sound moving forward, which is you're right. But when it comes to the nature of a, a material that absorbs that, acoustic velocity is essentially the speed at which a material is able to absorb. So a low velocity means that the product becomes almost soundproofing. So imagine like rubber, for example, um, or high velocity is things like granite or diamond, which isn't as porous and it's able to deflect more sound depending on how much sound is coming at it at a specific speed. So granite and basalt is about five and a half to six kilometers per second absorbent of sound. So it can handle up to those amounts of sound being thrown at it before the structural integrity of that rock begins to sort of um, break down, essentially. Um, so diamonds are 18 kilometers per second. That's what diamonds are able to handle before diamonds splinter under that sound wave coming at it. So w the fact that they already understand these acoustic properties, I wouldn't be surprised that they also know how to enhance these acoustic properties through the use of some form of material that they're able to like create an amplifier, and like a basic apply. amplifier for one. Correct. No, no, well, we put we 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 put that foam padding up on the walls in like podcasting rooms and stuff to 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 keep that sound in, right? So the sound doesn't dampen. The same, I believe, the same effect applies in this, but instead of like foam padding, it's this black substance that they cover the ceilings and the walls with. And this is across all the cave sites that I've been to, whether it's the rooms that have been uh, incompleted or whether they're like 90% completed or even some of the rooms that might be seen as like 100% completed. They all tend to have this substance laid in. But Is in some of the rooms... A sample of it, Foss? <laughs> yeah, well, the next time I go, dude, the next place I'm probably going to go to, to be honest with you, I'm probably going to go back to the Arangabad Caves in Sambaji Nagar. So that's the connecting city that most people use to go to Alora and Ajanta. So it sits in between. It's about it's about five kilometers both ways between Alora, which is on the west, and, and Ajanta, which is on the east, and Arangabad. It's now called Sambaji Nagar as the city, but that's the city as the sort of connecting transit point to go to these. So I will be going back there. I'll be going to both Alora again because me and my partner, her and I only got to see Kailasa Temple because dude, we spent the whole day just at that one thing. But like two kilometers down the road, there's a miniature version of Kailasa Temple. That's I've cut out of the same block. It's cut out of the same hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a there is over a hundred so, there's over a hundred caves that just comprise up Alora. A junta, it's about like 40 caves or something like that. Say, caves. It's important to remember it's ridiculous, man. When 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 Fuzzy and I um, speak about a janta, Alora caves, Barjar caves, these aren't small cave systems we're talking nine kilometers worth of cave system backed on to another 15 kilometers all with huge amounts of earth moved fantastic monuments in if you, monolithic if you look at Alora, triple headed doorways i mean it's absolutely magnificent these cave systems we, in what we're saying and just throwing out names we're not doing these sites justice if we edit this as a video rather than a podcast i'll make sure that all of these sites are placed on in picture image if it's uh, going to be an actual video um, and we'll have pictures of all this going through but we we need to remember fuzzy that you and i study these sites daily and uh honestly for want of a better word some of them are wonders of the world that are there today Obviously, the seven ancient wonders of the world don't remain anymore, but the wonders of the world today, many of them in my mind are in India without actually realising it. There's cave systems and temples that have been built there. I mean, I, 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 I love the Brihadishwara temple in Tamil Nadu. It just basically, it, it contains the nubs on the front of it. They're all round the site. So 
there was a knowledge of archive acoustics, there was a knowledge of the hallmarks, which there is all over India bar nowhere. The, the hallmarks are everywhere. So like I said earlier on, just to touch on a point that it seems as if India is some kind of central hub of it, not just engineering. I'm talking learning, engineering, skill sets, the knowledge to know where to build in the first place. That comes from leadership, from time. You don't just get that knowledge in a one -er. you You've got to have a progressional engineering schematic to get yourself to where you know how to engineer a site for hydrology, archaeoacoustic, pardon me, from when you need to build to such skill levels. And like you've said, I mean, this happened at the Kailasa Temple as well, just to add to another massively huge thing that happened there. 800 years after its so-called building, mainstream-wise, uh, Muslim armies went to destroy, I think there was 1,800 reported soldiers from the king himself now when you're reporting to go and destroy a temple that's what they mean you go and destroy he did not want it anymore well them soldiers all of them they have done damage to the site but in relative terms with their tool sets 800 years i think it's far longer than that if i'm brutally honest i think it was built a long long time before that but anyway 800 years in mainstream view, they could barely scratch it because this material had been painted over the Kailasa Temple. It basically makes it metallic and they had no way of destroying it. Now, we haven't got that today. Where's that come from? Now, it seems like that goo, that these things we're talking about, I'd love to know the compositions of these to know exactly what it is. And do you think there's an oral tradition that might help us with this or we might be able to ask within communities or do we do the testing ourselves and find out exactly what's going on for us? yeah the next time the next time i go i'll definitely get samples of the, the the rock that's covered in the black in the black substance the first time i've the first time i went the i i got some samples of what I suspect is geopolymers. I'm pretty confident in saying that just from some of the samples that I've gathered. Um, <clears throat> but I agree with you, these sites, they're definitely older than what mainstream historians hit them at. So none of the sites, and there's a, there's, there's a reference to a book that I would reference anyone to go and read about any of these cave sites, including Kailasa, Ajanta, et cetera, or the Ellora cave system. Um, which funnily enough actually is still part of the same mountain line that where Ajunta is. So there's actually a massive mountain range. Um, it almost presents as a plateau. And that same plateau is not just where Kailasa is, but also Ajunta. So you could actually argue that it's actually a singular site, which then pits it to well and truly over like 20 kilometers like worth of cave systems. And there's probably many, many more that haven't been uncovered. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of local knowledge, the only, the only credible local knowledge that I sort of acquired, and it was more of a happenstance situation, is when I went to the Kala Caves in Lonavala. Lonavala is about 50 kilometres about southeast from Mumbai. It's relatively close, or maybe like 75 kilometres. It's a beautiful town. It's like sort of a, a tourist hub, more or less. But the Kala Caves themselves is an interesting place, not, do, not just as it have one of the larger um, stupas, but it also shows very similar, the similar telltale signs of all these hall markings, whether that's the pinch holes, whether that's the nubs. So the nubs are littered across the roofs of some of these cave systems, which are like vamanas or these like prayer, uh, uh, meditation rooms. So you'll see this tri-banding that wraps along the insides, the, the, the ceiling of the insides of a lot of these rooms. And on that tri banding is these nubs. Now, I don't know the, I, I truly don't know the purpose of the nubs. I suspect they may have involved some sort of amplification effect around the acoustics. So, like, um, you know, if you look at those, uh, what do you call them? Um, they're not Colosseums. They're the, uh, they're almost like the theatre centres that are across Turkey. I forgot the specific names of them, but they're like those. Amphitheaters, thank you. So those amphitheaters have got like very unique properties when it comes to the acoustics. So I suspect that a lot of these cave systems that have the nubs also do. But when I was at the Kala Caves, an ex 
or he's told me he was an ex-MLA, whether he is or not. So that's like a, a ministerial legislative assembly. So someone pretty high up in the government, he was ex-MLA. Me and my partner were walking up to the Carla Caves. It's about 450 steps. Yeah, it's a, it's a massive hike up this mountain to get to the caves themselves. So I was rooted, bro. My, my missus is doing fine. I'm rooted. And this guy comes up to me and I caught it on the camera and he's got these big fancy sunglasses on. He's looking a million bucks and he, he just like pops his head. He looks at the camera, he looks at me and then he says, hello. And then we just got chatting, blah, blah, blah. His name's Satish. Um, so shout out Satish Patel is his name. Um, and when we got up to the caves and we had a few conversations, he basically explained to me that there's two sites at this, this place. There's a, there's a Hindu temple, right? That's out the front of the, the major Kala Chatya Hall and then the actual Buddhist rock cut caves themselves. Now, he said that the, the Hindu temple came into existence because the Pandava brothers that in the Mahabharata were sent out after they, they, they won in the war to go out to restore these sites. This female deity, I, I, I apologise to, to the Hindus that, are, that will be listening, but um, I forget the specific name of this female deity, but came to the Pandava brothers and explained to them about these sites and that they need to be restored. For, you know, lack of a better term. So they went out to all these sites across central India and restored them. And when I was at these sites, I began to see that degree of separation between construction period and between when there was the original construction period, which I suspect came from the, Holos, uh, the, the Pleistocene era. So let's say the, the time of people would say like Atlantis, Atlantis like 11,600 to 12,700 years ago. But then at some point in the distant past, during the events of the Mahabharata, which has been dated to around 5,500 BC, give or take, oh, sorry, 3,500 BC, so about 5,500, 6,000 years ago. And they restored these sites using what I suspect is a geopolymer, which is very distinguishable when you actually see the degree of separation between the rock types, because you can tell based on the actual chiseling marks that have been that have taken place on these rock walls. So when it's actual basalt and granite, the actual downward, the actual downward chiseling or scooping mechanisms that are taking place have a very distinct lines on them, as opposed to this secondary application, which almost looks like some sort of plaster, but it's made out of composite rock and it's got bits of quartz in it, it's got bits of granite in it. And I ended up doing a bit of a deep dive into how like this Roman concrete, doesn't it? Almost like Correct. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I found to be really interesting, and there's a guy on Twitter called Marcel. I'll send you his, I'll send you his Twitter handle. I've forgotten it. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, Marcel, so his name is. He's that's the it, that's it. Guy. <laughs> Dude, you know what he showed me? He showed me a map that he's been working on where these natron sources, so he's using, he's using this method of water glass, which is, which is sodium, uh, sodium carbonate, which is essentially like, uh, it's, it's sodium carbonate mixed with wood ash. And then before it sets or before the process of whatever takes place in this, in this alchemical mixture, he adds like the grains of granite, he adds the grains of basalt, he adds grains of rock, and what forms is something that looks like that. It actually looks like it. And he sent some photos of maps across India. These are all done on Google Earth, mind you, where he's taken research papers of natron sources. Natron is like the term for the sodium carbonate. And they're all right next to these in cave sites, bro. So I suspect that the, at least the Pandava brothers from the Mahabharata probably had a deep understanding of knowledge of the geopolymers and they were the probably ones that applied these to sort of restore the sites for further use for the next you know two three four five thousand years but the original construction i absolutely believe is is from the pleistocene era because the fact that they're all geomagnetically aligned in the major complexes in each site whether that is the kailasa temple right so the central Hindu mandir that has a it has a massive granite lingam inside of it. That's directional as west. When you look at on the opposite side, there's a there's a temple dedicated to Vishnu. When you look at the the north and the south, is the pillars 
um, that you see on all like the Instagram photos of Kailasa Temple and stuff like that. But what's in the center between this north, south and east axis is the sacred bull, the Nandi, which sits in this room and it's almost the center point. It's literally the central focal point for this north, south, east, west. So to even understand, it's one thing for the ancients to understand north and south longitude, but to understand latitude requires like a whole other spectrum of technology. So they, whoever built these sites had a, had a very deep understanding of the, elect, the, the, the magnetic lines on the planet. These builders had a deep understanding of the acoustic properties of these cave sites. Massive. And they obviously understood how to manipulate the earth in order to create these sites, whether that is to cut through basalt, granite and quartz, which requires immense modern technology of what we have today. Yeah, on a mouse scale, you've got it with, like you tried correct. to explain earlier. You've got to have something harder than the material you're cutting to cut it. So if you're cutting well, out the side, you're diamond, you know. Well, see, andesite's slightly softer than basalt, but not by much. You're very, very not marginal. Much. Not by much. Very marginal. Yeah, you not by much. You granite know, obviously is even with granite and granite slightly softer, even still. But you, I've watched diamond tip saws really struggle with granite on its own, let alone and anything harder. So it's one thing to say potentially this material can cut another, but sometimes when you've even got that material to put that into practice is very much different, isn't it? You know, I mean, diamond tip tools are diamond tip tools, but fuzzy, they don't just rip through granite or andesite like it's butter. That is not the way it happens. 100%. Uh, dude, it's, it's crazy. And there's some sites that are in Tamil Nadu uh, that on the temples themselves, there's these, these almost like seating arrangements that are made out of granite and there's literally <clears throat> there's literal scoop marks in the granite and you're like what how how did they manage to do that well i also believe i also have a suspicion that if these ancients had a very very good understanding of acoustic properties and how to utilize acoustics then they probably and just from what we've discussed they already have a deeper understanding of the nature of acoustics and vibration and likely frequency. So if they understand these acoustic properties, it's not out of the realm of possibility that they could also manipulate acoustics in order to break materials down. So One imagine, yeah, so everyone, oh, bro, everyone, everyone, everyone has seen the video. Dude, everyone's seen the video of a man or a woman making a particular making a particular tune at a wine glass and a wine glass cracking right shattering it's it's actual properties it's crystalline structure breaks that however same effect however, is amplified with uh, take that comment right mm. that same glass that shatters if you slow it down before it shatters it actually wobbles and goes malleable so in fast motion you know, opera singer, oh, it's a crack. Slow that down. The glass actually goes malleable first. Now, what if they could control that malleable state within stone and then you could? 100% do. I, I w from what I've seen, I nothing, nothing shocks me now from what I've seen at these caves because there's too many telltale signs of what I guess we would look at as high technology. And I know when someone might hear high technology, their their brains are automatically going to be drawn. You know, dude, they're drawn to television, laptops, phones. Like that's the pinnacle of high technology in our modern age, right? But we we I suspect we've just deviated a different path of technology. Well, yeah, we're kind of in the glass. Actually. We hold our technology in our hand. We look at it on in front of us. We presume the internet's telling us everything we need to know. When you're actually on site and you see it with your own eyes, like I said to you, you don't only just get the feeling of it, you can, you're not meant to, but you can touch a lot of these sites, you can feel what's going on, you can feel the mineralogies, you can run the testing with sounds, you can take the photos, you can scan with LiDAR on your phones now, you can do the boots on ground work. And like you said, like I, we'll, we'll go back to the pinch holes. The pinch holes are very, very interesting hallmark because uh, we'll go to Malta, Hypogeum, Cephalini again, where the pinch holes are. And they are reported to be 3,500 years old. So 
we're just going off mainstream here. We're not delving into anything else. We're not. We're just giving theories on what's actually there. If you talk through these pinchos, you can hear like a bass system, like an amplifier, all the way over the other side of the temple, like you and me are talking now. So their application of technology was just different than ours. We've got to remember that we're stood on the shoulder of giants here, simple as that, and that we simply aren't those people. We've got to look at this from a, not our science, but more alchemical application of sciences. That doesn't mean that we're any more advanced. It's completely different. They're just not the same sciences at all. And let's be honest, archaeology and science can't agree on whether their farts smell the same, let alone anything else. So it does come down to boots on ground researchers to have these experiences, to podcast, to get on institutes, to really talk about what's actually happening out there in the ancient world. It gives a more realistic view, Fuzzy, you know? Yeah, and it's interesting when you mentioned about the technology because when you look at the acoustic properties of these sites and how they behave in some of these rooms, like in these vamanas, in these sort of like meditation rooms, um, and bear in mind, these rooms, the floors are rooted, yeah? They're not flat. Like, you'll see the benches. Some of the benches are what they see as the beds. Some of them are quite flat. Some of them are quite well sculpted. Some are quite rudimentary like they're sort of early workings but all the floors are rooted like i can't imagine like buddhists are like sleeping on half of these things i know that in modern times or in sort of in the last thousand years they've definitely been used for these but i can't imagine what that's what their original sort of purpose was for just to be sleeping quarters essentially i don't suspect that but what i found interesting is when you mentioned about the acoustics is we use some of those acoustic properties today like ultrasound technology yeah this idea of ultrasound therapy, this idea of permeating permeating specific frequencies into the body in order to rip apart tumors, damaged cells, stuff like that. So you apply that knowledge and you go back in time to these rooms that have got this black covering on them that amplifies the acoustic properties of these rooms. I wouldn't be surprised if some of these sites, if not all of these sites held multiple purposes not just to provide water for locals and not just to provide healing for let's say the sick in some of these rooms because you can go into some of these rooms and you might have some sort of ailment and the only thing that seems to fix it is by being in these rooms and chanting a specific mantra and the mantra set aside whatever that is being chanted the actual acoustic frequency that vibrates back into oneself is causing this vibrational effect that's breaking down any any irregularities in the human body essentially Funny you but then you've that. got egypt you've got uh, back in the day reported that it, it, the, the tune that was playing around egypt was at a c and an f chord did you which your body is attuned at which gave you a general feeling of good health whether it was an, at an infrasound level or whether it was actually bass notes playing we all know the pyramid tunes bit off at the moment of course but they would have been harmonized to help the body i get it the ailments were different we didn't understand doctor as much as we do now but and matriarchal was matriarchal because men bled and died before women because bacteria caused us to bleed from the penis and we didn't know how to control that until more better medicines came around antibiotics and so on and then that matriarchal style society changed because we were living a hell of a lot longer you know now maybe they adapted or they at that point my opinion is egyptians inherited the plateau and i think that they found and ad adapted themselves to technologies that were already there I, I think india what we're seeing you're right like you can mention the oracle room at the hypogeum it's a room where it, it's 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 based on that you can speak in there and outside you won't understand what's going on in that room you just can't and like in india i get that same feel that these rooms had maybe a room for learning a room for uh you know for ailments as you put it and um a, ro a room for communications maybe uh teachings i'd say maybe you advanced in levels of engineering maybe and you had an engineering because it, it 
it seems to me, and I make this, it's it's not a joke either. I say this on X when I, I've had a bit of time off there at the minute, but when I'm on there, I use this a lot. And I'll say, like, how, how many Master Masons are actually in India? And I'm not being funny. I'm asking the question. People laugh at that. No, how many Master Masons were in India? Because at Mainstream's time of their building, there would have had to have been 10,000, 20,000, 40,000. Look, you don't get master masons like that over time anywhere. It's, I don't, I know they work at it today. I know how hard Indian people were. I know there's master craftsmen there now. They're not building the Kailasa temple today. If that is not a, what's happening at all. Miniature versions, small versions of Angkor Wat being built, Cambodia to India. I'm telling you now, they are not replicating. The ancient work, it's impossible to replicate. It's just not going to happen, Fuzzy. And what I want to understand is how these ancient engineers incorporated archaeoacoustics, hydrology, knowing the mineralogy of the sites and how to build through hydrology, mineralogy, and to gain then the archaeoacoustical effect for the people that you were going to then add to the site. Because you weren't to know there was going to be thousands and thousands of people coming in need if you were just a builder to that site, you know. Uh, and it just seems ridiculous how many masons there must have been there in that small amount of construction time. That's why, to me, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, Fuzzy. Well, there's actually, there's actually mason lodges in India. There's actually quite a handful of mason lodges in India. Um, some of the... Two of the oldest mason lodges, one is in, in Mumbai or in Bombay, I think, you know, when it was sort of in its inception, but it's it's built into an old temple um, and it's quite old. I, I don't know, I've had, had a mate of mine tell me it's like two, two and a half thousand years old and that place has been like a, like a vestibule for like sort of building and construction knowledge at this like mason hall before it actually, be, before it was even called like a mason's lodge. Um, and I think there's another one in De or just outside of Delhi in a, in a town called Noida. Um, there might be some others as well, but they're like two that I know of. But I wouldn't be surprised at all because the actual, the actual architectural knowledge that is required for these sites is, is it is beyond the scope of what we're able to do now. I, I think, and it's not just from the sheer volume of the sites and the amount of rock that has to be moved because there's no blueprints anywhere. And none of these cave sites, not a single one of these cave sites, and I was going to mention a book earlier, but I didn't end up mentioning it. It's called the Indica, Indica Epigraphic. And it is a compilation of all the historical detailings from all these cave sites, including Kailasa Temple and the Aurora Complex, comprised up into this massive compendium. And in the entirety of the compendium, there is, not sing there is not a single mention about the construction methods or the tools that have gone in to build these sites. The only thing that has ever referenced. That's what baffles me. Now, I've got a question for you. When I did, well, I've done multiple videos on India. You know how much it fascinates me. The Vedas, the Vedic texts, right? I've got, I've got copies of them. They fascinate me. The stories at the back the alchemical recipes, not just the songs and things like that that have multiple meanings. No, no, no. The back of it fascinated me. But I read that that's only 15% and that 85% is at the Vatican. Now, what is it doing there? Why hasn't the Indian people got the Vedic text and the Vedas? Why, why is the Catholic Church got it? That's what I've heard. I don't know whether I'm right or wrong there by any slim chance, but I know that there's a lot of the Vedic texts are missing. And where the hell are they then? And I, I did my research led me to believe that the, it was at the Catholic Church, mate. You're on mute. I've lost your sign, fuzzy lad.
Hola. Con ella. <laughs> you ran out of batteries on your earpods. How about now? Yeah, got you, mate. All right. I don't know what it's like. The Wi-Fi dropped out. Um, if we just, you'll have to do an edit, but the last thing you're talking well, about, you had just long, up. Mate. Any edits are absolutely fine, mate. We, oh, that's, that's why okay. you have a drink that's when I'm not talking, because Rick will bring you up on a video <laughs> where it's you. Yeah. And then, and then yep. it basically swaps around. Don't worry about nothing like that. And if you <laughs> okay. don't like something, we just podcast it anyway and <clears throat> full video yep. over the top of it and me and you won't even be on it it's only our voice that i give a shit about you know what i mean yeah, so yeah, don't, okay. worry about it. don't worry about nothing like that. that that's okay thank you um i guess you'll have to restart you had just started talking about the vaders like just start talking about it when i cut out do you want me to crack back on or do you want to jump in with your answer to i think that would be the best I didn't even hear what you said. Like, you, you didn't mention the said, Vaders and then everything. Well, no, nah, you mentioned no, the Vaders I mean, and everything cut again, out. Well, right then, one of my, right then, for the it going, we're back online. We had a momentary lapse of concentration with internet. So, where we were and what we were talking about and where I was was, I was on about the Vaders and the Vedic texts. And that it seems like when I read them, they're fascinating to me. And I did my readings. It, it, it's the alchemical stuff that I loved. But well, it's said that there's only 15%, and you're talking like nearly 3,000 pages, and 85% of it is it the Catholic Church. Now, what is it doing there, number one, and why isn't it with the Indian people? Because within there really could be the engineering schematic that we are talking about right now, which is what, and I hate to say, and I don't care either, because I'm pagan, so I don't really give a monkeys about anything else, <laughs> is that... It, this should be, I mean, in the, the Indian people deserve to know the rest of the Vedic texts and the Vedas, in my opinion. I think so does the rest of the world, because with that in mind, the Indian people are so brilliant at sharing knowledge. I mean, I've got such good Indian friends in India and in the UK uh, that I, I've been humbled by how well I've been, like, because I've shown some kind of interest in Hindu and and Tamil and and all sorts of different, not just religion, but the building schematic, the engineering. And I've asked the questions, the hard questions to some of these temple owners. I've had to get to know them over years, you know what I mean? And even then, it's very touchy-feely on, I, I, I'm telling them about what I can see on their temple, and they didn't know about it. And they're like, wow you're right and they've gone and investigated it and then come back to me and said you're right there's more of that as well we didn't even know about that and i was like wow so slowly but surely gained a friendship with the bradishwara temple other temples in the tamil and the do region that now i consider friends that i would go and visit there and humbly show any appreciations that i would need to and ask advices and i think word of mouth at the top level within the engineering on some of these temples is a bit hush hush because so it should be you ain't lifting 200 ton granite blocks onto the top of a temple with no technology in india they did it for fun and then carved it into perfection at the top of it i mean come on i mean it's just like insane what they were capable of doing then let alone archaeoacoustics these temples are unrivaled in majesty in um i would say in ornate genius some of the ornate work 
look, this isn't just moving two million three hundred and fifty thousand blocks in twenty years, wanting to place every five minutes, which is a crock of shit. No, we're looking at ornate temples that were coated in a substance that made them metallic so they couldn't be destroyed. These temples had hydrology setups. They had hypogeums all around the temple. All Let's make this clear, all around the temple. Now, this is spectacular, not only in design, but in original design, in blueprint. Now, why haven't we got those blueprints? Where are the engineering writings because India is meticulous at what they do. And I've known that since I started research in India about 10 years ago, they're meticulous, but they're nowhere to be seen, any records anywhere. And it bemuses me. So I wondered whether they are in the Vedic texts or the remaining Vedas and are they at the Catholic church, Fuzzy? Look, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's, obviously there's some within the Roman Catholic archives for sure. Um, I also think there was a lot that was destroyed during the Mughal invasion. You've got to bear in mind the sort of like, um, conquest since like, oh, I think the first point was like 900 AD, 1000 AD, somewhere there was when the conquest of Sindh happened. That was the first time that like there was yeah. an Islamic, um, force that pushed into the Indus Valley region came in there. The conquest of Sindh is actually what the events called. Um, so since then, obviously the expansion, um, of, of Islam, the, the Mughal empire at the time expanding across India or Bharat as, as all the locals know it as, um, there was something that there's somewhere in the ballpark of about 50,000 temples that were either destroyed majority, um, or converted into mosques. So That's there's that. And I, yeah. Oh. Yeah, dude, there was quite a consumer. And this is not just in India today. This is also in Pakistan. So where the Rishis that wrote the Vedas came from, they came from the northern section of Pakistan. So there's a region in the northern section of Pakistan called Taxila. And Taxila has some monumental structures. One, they've got stupas. So much like the stupas that are inside the Ajanta caves or the stupas that are inside the Nasik caves or any of the caves across central India, these are stupas that are outside, not within confined of, of four walls. But these stupas, and I did a ma I did a huge extensive amount of research into hydrology reports across Pakistan in the Taxila regions or the northern sections of Pakistan where the Rishis and the Vedas were written. There's all these stupas that are littered across the mountain ranges and they all sit on top of underground aquifers. They're essentially oh beacons, God. markers. They're all over, bro. There's well and truly over 150 of them across the northern reaches of Pakistan. What? And these are all, yeah, dude, there's so many, men. And this is where everyone got like, you know, if you go to like the museum in Delhi or the museum in Mumbai, you can see all these sculptures that have been taken from these sites. Dude, they're all made out of granite. And they're so intricate. There's these tiny little bowls like that are like um, cups that have got lids. They almost like look like a teapot. And they're so intricate in their design. They're carved perfectly. They've got this little like fine drilling technique to actually carve out little images on them and everything. And these are all found in the Tuxilla regions in a, in a region called Gandhara. And Gandhara, I believe, is the region where the, the Rishis actually wrote the Vedas or supposedly wrote the Vedas or had the Vedas passed on to them from maybe someone else. I, I'm not too sure. But I've looked at extensive hydrology reports across northern reaches of Pakistan in the Taxila region, and there is hundreds of these underground aquifers that are hopped, that are marked on these hill lines with these massive stupas. Now, some of them are still there today. Some of them have been dismantled. Some of them are in like sort of a halfway form, like they've begun, you know, people have come, local villagers have come and like taken the rocks away, used it for their own building and construction, stuff like that. Very common practice, unfortunately. Um, but whoever built these sites, I suspect, are also the same builders that built all these cave systems. Because that, and I haven't been obviously to these northern reaches of Pakistan. I'd love to be able to go, obviously, Pakistan's a bit of a different cultural implication as opposed to India. Yes, there's quite a considerable amount of, like there's over 200 million Muslims that live in India, but in Pakistan, there's more, um, there's less regulation around like what can what you can do essentially, especially when it comes to the nature of tourism and exploration. And the northern reaches of Pakistan, they're very treacherous, not just from a cultural and religious aspect, 
but also from a topographical aspect. It's very rocky terrain, mountainous regions. These are regions that the Himalayas pour their, their mountain water from snow-capped mountain ranges and stuff like that. It all comes down through these mountain ranges and these hill lines where these stupas actually sit on. Um, so when we talk about the builders and having this deeper understanding of hydrology, it, it, it gets very interesting to me when I, when I, as I mentioned earlier, when I've gone to these sites and I see how the water is used and I don't suspect it's just used for what we've already discussed. I also suspect from going to some of these cave sites that there's also a secondary application linked to piezoelectric effects. So all these sites that I've been to so far all have stupas. Now, the most prominent stupas that are connected to ceilings, and you don't see these connected to ceilings in many of the caves, but there are some that they are, and they're like almost like, and they certainly are the original design. These stupas have quartz inlaid within them. But I want to focus on almost this idea of load-bearing piezoelectrical effect. So these pillars and these these stupas that are connected to the ceilings, and bear in mind, like if you go, and I'd, I, I, it would be a blessing to take you to these sites one day, brother. But at the Baja Caves in um, in, uh, in uh, Lonavala, where the Kala Caves are, there's a, an open cavity across the sides of these cave systems where there's a bunch of these little stupas and some of these stupas are connected into the ceiling and some of them are not. Ah, but where it's not connected these are lighting into... systems, L lots of lighting systems, maybe using the granite well, as piezo lighting effect. It could it could it could mean all sorts, but piezoelectric agreed could be a huge implication to these temples alongside everything else as well, couldn't it? Well, I think it's having I think it I think the original designs are to have an an implicit effect on not just the hydrology and the water itself, but also into the acoustic effects as well. So when we talk about electrifying water, what yeah. happens when you electrify water? It kills off impurities, right? It kills off bacteria. So there's that effect of making the water much cleaner to drink by default. Now, these pillars that are littered all across these cave sites that actually hold up the mountains, essentially, including the stupas at some of these sites, have very specific geometry to them. And they come in in such a way, and especially with the stupas, that it's almost like the way it's been geometrically designed is to actually channel the load-bearing mechanics of the what? mountains into these pillars, wow. into these structures. And if these structures that are carved out have quartzite littered within them, what happens? Well, you have this natural low voltage piezoelectric effect that's constantly yeah. there because yeah. it's holding up the mountain, right? There's 100%. pressure being channeled down into this structure. Yeah. Yeah. So when you when you put water into these rooms, when you if if these rooms are destined to be this culmination of a few different elements that sort of provide a few effects, whether it's to acoustic properties in healing, acoustic properties in 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 communication, acoustic properties in water management, or sorry, in, 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 in electrical effects in terms of managing water, in terms of making water cleaner. There's a few obviously that sort of spring to mind when you see these sites, but but I'd be remiss to, to mention these things because when someone understands geometry and how geometry plays a massive role in all, all temple sites or all massive megalithic structures across the world. It does, it's not just India. Like there's obviously an effect, there's obviously a complicit, an, an efficient, uh, sorry, an efficient, a, a very specific effect when you look at, when you look at Egypt and you look at like the pyramid of, of, of Khufu and in the, in, uh, in the, in the King's chamber, I think it is, or in the Queen's chamber, up in the recesses of the ceiling is those massive eight granite slabs. Those granite slabs have granite beams between them to hold them all up. They're sitting on. They're sitting between a, a massive amount of of sandstone, huge amounts of weight that sit on top of them. Let alone you look at places like the Sarapium of Sakar, brother. You know those massive granite boxes. You want my honest, like far out there thought on what those are? 
those boxes, I suspect, and I'm gonna, I don't care to say this now, I've thought about this, about turning into some sort of business model in the future, but I don't care. If this thing becomes something, then I know I've done justice in providing some sort of renewable energy for the future. But I suspect that what these massive granite boxes, and these are massive, yeah, these boxes are over like 50, 60 tonnes, may probably more do. These are probably in the hundreds of tonnes, to be honest with you. And that's not accounting for the lids. When you look at these sites, what's the one consistent thing across a lot of these like ancient cultures is how sacred the bull is, how sacred the cows are. And when you look at these Sarapeum of Sakaar, there's only been one thing that's ever been found in these boxes. Now, obviously the Sarapeum of Sakaar is not just one room, it's a bunch of different rooms that are all connected, that have these massive granite boxes in them. There's only ever been a bull's, a, a partial amount of a bull skull found within them. Imagine if you knew the, the technology around pressurization on a piezoelectric material and able to manipulate a chemical environment in order to cause pressure to build up inside these boxes. Now, I know it's referenced in some ancient Egyptian texts, and I definitely know it's mentioned in Hindu texts when it comes to the nature of lingams and when it comes to the nature of um, beams of light. There's always mentions about these sites and like how they light up, you know, these beams of light, whether it's the lingams or whether it's these, these structures across Egypt. And I suspect that these boxes and I know we're deviating off of India, but I suspect that these boxes in like the Sarapemus car probably had these cows in them, these bulls, these sacred bulls. And there was other things mixed in into these essential chambers, these baths, you could say, or these, yeah, these tanks that would have the bovine in it, the bull wrapped up with other things in it. Now, obviously you see on a lot of the, you see on a lot of the visual descriptions of these sites, is there's always sacred bulls, there's always hops, so imagine beer, and yeast. And what comes with that, yeah? That comes the growing of bacteria, the growing of yeast, and what happens when, when yeast expands, when yeast grows in an environment that's a hotbed for yeast to grow in, what does yeast release? It releases gas. That's why when you make bread, bread rises because the gases are building inside the bread. What if you're able to build something inside these granite boxes, yeah? And this yeast builds up and this, this gas builds up inside these monumental granite boxes. What's it gonna cause? It's gonna cause immeasurable amounts of slow building pressure that pushes on these walls and subsequently would begin to cause a piezoelectric effect. Now, I don't know what the voltage output of these things would be, but if you apply the idea of water back into these mechanics, and then layer in the acoustic properties and all these extra things. I think there's a multi-dimensional layer that takes place across these ancient sites scattered across the planet. And I suspect that, and I believe, not even suspect, I believe wholeheartedly that acoustics is playing a major role in, in, in what these sites' original purposes were for, much yeah. like piezoelectricity. Now, when you think about that and conceptualise that an idea of a time when man wasn't meant to have these tools or this knowledge it makes you wonder then like well then how well like all of us who are interested in this stuff we tend to obviously draw to some ancient time because anatomically right humans human beings homo sapiens we're at a bare minimum from from archaeological paleontology paleontolo uh, what is it called um, anthropological works we're what, 300,000 years old, between 250 to 300,000, anatomically, the size of our brain, able to distinguish tools and build things, et cetera, et cetera. Look what we've done in 100 years. We've built phones. We've built literally rockets that go up into, go up and outside of Earth's orbit. We've done this within 100 years, but we're 250 to 300,000 years old. So it leaves a big window of interpretation of what humanity is capable of. And I suspect that all these sites were built in, a, in another age, in another time, in the time of people would look at as like the time of Atlantis, this 11,600 to 12,700 year period or even older. And obviously there's been, there's been sculptures and, and, and actual archeological evidence to show that there is places in India, mainly revolving around the Indus Valley, that region of Tuxila in Pakistan, where there's actually been like small sculptures of like Shiva and stuff that have been found that have been dated to like 20,000 years to it. There's actual sculptures inside the Delhi Museum that actually show this and show the dating period. But 
the Archaeological Survey of India, they'll never agree to these datings. These have just been rudimentary datings that have been done on like bits of carbon samples, you know, from, from dirt and stuff like that have been pulled up from the actual sculptures themselves, but they're all made from rock. Whether they're made from basalt or whether they're made from granite is irrespective. Like there's actual datings on the carbon or the carbon deposits that have been found on these things. And I go, wow, what did these ancients really truly understand about how not just the physical environment works, but also how the mind works in these environments. So the archaeoacoustic properties that you discuss, well, sure, why can it why can't it possibly be that some of these sites were destined and designed to heal the body? We use it today, like I mentioned earlier, in, 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 in ultrasound therapy with breaking up of tumors using very specific frequencies, or whether it's used for what is referred to as micro mixing is the term that it is. So micro mixing is the application of acoustics in order to break apart the toxins and the bad bacterium that exists within a body of water. So when you apply enough frequency and enough acoustics to it, it actually breaks down the molecular structure of bacterium that's not native to the, the, the environment of H2O, of, of water, essentially. So it makes things cleaner as well. It makes it more drinkable. So all these, all these little effects, it truly screams to me that the ancients, these builders, whether they're global builders or not, and I believe that they are global builders, I suspect that you do as well, laid these systems out across the planet for us, for our generation, to actually understand and improve upon our own lives by utilising these things that have been left for us. And obviously works have gone in over the recent millennia to restore these sites or to repair these sites, maintain these sites, whether it's the Pandava brothers that went out you know, after winning the war in the Mahabharata and went across and restored all these sites, and I suspect they knew how to manipulate or create geopolymers for protection of these sites, or whether it's the archaeological survey of India and the British Empire that went out and, and did restoration works at some of these sites. Irrespective, all these sites have original builders and they're showing all the same hallmark signs, whether that's the nubs, whether that's the pinch holes, whether that's the, the magnetically magnetic alignment of these sites, whether they're all the sites have something to do with, uh, with, with acoustics or whether they have something to do with hydrology, they're all showing the same signs globally. So there's clearly an indicator that one set of builders, and this could have been builders over many generations, mind you, this might not have just been five or 10 builders that just went out. This could have been a thousand year plan, bro. This could have been a 500 year plan. If, if, if we knew that there was a ca catastrophe coming, right, and 90% of our, our civilization, 90% of our species is going to get obliterated, why wouldn't we create things, whether that's cave paintings, whether that's the pyramids, whatever, that in order to leave that's those that's hallmarks great, for great us? Great thought. And with that in mind, if you did then say, right, here's a 500 year plan, I'd be more inclined to look at that equation and think, yeah, we can put Kailasa temples and pyramids and things into place. We can restore temples. We would have enough time to work as a team, as a manufacturing unit to put together. I mean, even if we had JCB themselves and every major, but we'd need more than that for Trilithon Stones. We could go on all day about lifting capabilities in the ancient world and the crock of shit that's written about it but you need time scale to provide a finished product as an engineer and that starts with a plan doesn't it you know and you need the right people you need the right machinery i don't care that that comes out like that machines are what you need if you are using hand tools you're not carving a mountain. It's it's not happening. I, I'll give you a copper axe if you want. And I'll tell you what, I'll give you a diamond tip drill from today. Chainsaw and whatever diamond tip tools that you want for your team of 300 people, go and replicate it for me. It's impossible. So something else 
was going on. I, I like what we were talking about on a level of if you were using archaeoacoustics and mineralogy and you could use uh, amplification and I love that glass breaking analogy. If you could get to that malleable kind of frequency with stone mineralogy itself, then you would be able to play around with it. I don't think they were designing geopolymers. I think that's slightly wrong in my opinion. I don't, maybe in some cases, yes, like Roman concrete, these kind of plasters that you're seeing that have got different mineralogies of stone blatantly in there and they're trying to fuse it together. Yeah, human attempts to geopolymer. I personally think that it was more of a stone softening, not alchemical, but the use of, I, I think that would have been possible. I think that's where the idea came from, Neanderthal, Ignatian, gravity, and so on, so on. Stone softening alchemically. But I, I, I think engineers were able to more make the stone slightly malleable. So they could use archaeoacoustics, change of frequency, use those frequencies, and you could change it by how you've described with these different hydrologies, waters used with archaeoacoustics. You change the water levels, the pressures ever so slightly, and it would adapt those frequencies up and down. You then would use amplification methods, i.e. bigger halls, nubs as an application, if that's what, people think and I think the hypogee and cephalina they use they call it a niche a niche block it's like an enormous nub and they played sound through it and you could hear it 600 meters as an amplification away which is when we studied that 256 feet I think the schematic is that you could that subterraneanly through granite blocks quartz spilling out of it they're connected. So, of course, you would be able to hear that through that niche hole. I would suggest there's pinch holes running through there as well, which there are at Malta, you know. And then, then we're looking at, it's not advanced communication, but it's communication using archaeoacoustics that we didn't understand that our ancients were capable of. So there's a distinguish, you've got to distinguish between I guess the the comment high technology but in my opinion i think the use of hydrology to use mineralogy as an archaeoacoustic to maybe make stone malleable or manipulate sounds for healing and uh, look that to me is technology that to me is a high technology that is amazing and if we could prove that which i think we can by doing frequency testing uh, there's teams out there in the world that welcome frequency testing, but there's rules and schematics to it, which we can go through if you ever do any testing with me. I want to do this, by the way. I don't want to just talk about it. I want to go to India and I want to run the tests on these frequencies in these temples, change the frequency and see whether we get some of these columns playing maybe a different note, because if it plays at a G and I get a C, that's where our hidden frequencies are. And who knows what doors might open at that point in time, Fuzzy, because it intrigues me, this does, because for once, feels like we're getting somewhere with the answers, you know? It doesn't feel like, oh, maybe it's this, or maybe, because with archaeoacoustics, with the application of water, which is very prevalent, as we've discussed today, we're looking on your level in India that they're, they're actually using it to a very fine margin all around temples to promote mass amounts of frequency. And uh, not only that, the amplification of it, as you say, like a whisper, could not only be promoted as a whisper, but a complete echo all over. The, well, that says to me, and you've said to me today, you've, you've proven a lot of what we've spoken about on our shows of the Institute over the last four months, you've proven boots on ground that I think we've actually got something to go on here. I think that we're very close to finding out, especially with how you've put it. I love your ideas on how these the water was being cleaned from its source level and maybe filtered through mountains, basically using 
I mean, if you understood how to do that and you were filtering through mountains, I get it that natural springs would I bring in. But we're not just talking about that. We're talking about archaeoacoustics, then separating amounts of water, building temples around it, using that for healing, maybe learning teachings. Not just learning, maybe teachings. Maybe you go there, go into that room, you get your feeling of awe, and all of a sudden you start thinking, wow, I need to be here doing my teachings. My That temple then gives you what you need, doesn't it? And I, look, I think back then these temples were far more than they are today. I really do. It gives, it makes my hairs stand up on the back of my neck. It's like the Indian, I, I, I'm pagan and I live in England, but it's like the Indian gods are going, I'm so glad that you're looking at this. You will get to the bottom of this. And the, I feel that the answers are in India, mate. That's why it's been such a great conversation to have with you, mate. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know how much time we have left, but it also has been, first and foremost, it's been an absolute pleasure because I've been having these thoughts just bubbling away in my head for so long and I haven't had this chance to sort of express them to someone. So it's been, first and foremost, it's been a pleasure. Um, but with these acoustic properties that are across these sites, you know, it depends on how deep you want to delve into it, but even the idea of like the ethereal, the spiritual, let's say, that idea of using the acoustic properties to transcend, someone might say it as astral project, let's say when we, when we think about the idea of communication, right? We, we think in a very, most people tend to think in a very, not rudimentary box, but this idea of sound traveling, someone on the other end hearing it, doesn't matter what it goes through, this idea of communication, but if we delve into a bit of nuance and this idea of like, uh, whether someone wants to say telepathy is, is something else, but this idea of transcending the physical and moving into a realm of ethereal, a realm of spiritual, that itself, that opens up gateways to a whole realm of technologies in some respect. These are technologies that would be seen as, in my view, would be seen as almost like nuanced spiritual technologies, whether that's to, you know, gain enlightenment through knowledge acquisition, right? <clears throat> or whether that's using these acoustic properties at these these temple sites in order to, as I mentioned before, heal yourself, you know, and maybe that idea of crossing the boundaries of different sites Maybe that idea of these sites are set up in such a way that some of these rooms or some of these quarters that are of comprise up these these major sites are used definitely to communicate with other sites through the use of the acoustic properties and maybe reaching some level of like a, 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 a spiritual plane or an ethereal plane that your consciousness may be able to to sort of reach into. Now, anyone that thinks that's far fetched. I would recommend, and I would never recommend this generally speaking, but everyone has an understanding, I would hope, about like the idea of like psychedelics and stuff like that, right? Whether it's um, DMT and whether it's psilocybin cubensis magic mushrooms, whether it's the stuff that's taken in South America. Um, in, in India, it's um, Datura, the Datura flower, and that's described in a lot of Hindu texts is a substance that only Shiva himself is able to, to absorb and able to withstand the effects of Datura. And that's a plant that's used <clears throat> constantly in, in pujas, which is, a, which is a ritual essentially, or dashan, which is an offering. Um, so people that go up to like some of these, these mega, mega, mega old temples that are, you know, like I mentioned the Jotalings, um, they, a lot of people tend to come with like a basket of flowers. There'll be prasad, which is like something that you eat afterwards when you give this darshan, this donation. But what tends to comprise up these baskets, these offerings, is a psychedelic. And <clears throat> it wouldn't surprise me that these ancient builders, whoever they are, probably had a pretty good idea of how the mind operates, not just from a physical perspective, but maybe from an ethereal an ethereal out there perspective of consciousness. And when we look at this idea in Hinduism is everyone's connected. Everyone's consciousnesses are connected to some, to some ethereal, ethereal, massive consciousness. And that connects us all through like this idea of, I guess, like um, 
uh, what's that term that's used? Um, string theory, that idea of string, string theory, how everything's connected. That Those ideas, they've been in ancient Hindu texts in the Vedas since time immemorial. It's not like a nuanced thing, like these things have been discussed, even though the approach of the discussion might be different. The idea of what they are, right? Fuzzy, you've gone again. Fuzz have left your brother. Fuzzy, Fuzzy. I've got you. It's cut it's... me out again, dude. I'm so sorry. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. We'll just call it again. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so... <clears throat> Yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if these sites that these ancient builders laid out had the idea imparted into the architecture to essentially using, and of course, using these, uh, these acoustic properties and the combination of hydrology, maybe there's this nuanced approach with piezoelectricity as well. Maybe, I'm not too sure, but we'll keep it relative to the acoustic properties for now is I wouldn't be surprised that these could elevate your consciousness to such a degree that you might be able to reach some ethereal spiritual state, thus allowing you to connect to maybe multiple sites. And then I probably, love that. I wouldn't I love be surprised. That. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised, man. Honestly, I, the day you get here, dude, and the day I get to take you to some of these caves, you are going to lose your mind. You'll walk into some of these rooms, you'll whisper a word, bro, and it is amplified times 10. This is why this is priceless for me. That's priceless. Why well, I, I want to be testing somewhere like that. That's exactly yeah, yeah. what I want. Fuzzy, well, I'll, I'll, this is relevant to me, I, I dare say, not the podcast, but um i've got to go to the toilet in a minute so rick will have to call <laughs> that's right um, i'm not being rude or nosy at all so tell me to shut up but I, you know i would love to come to india big time have you got a sofa surface space for me to travel and come to you and then travel with you from yours and go and do what we do or are you in like a <laughs> one bedroom sat up and you're fucked with your missus and I don't want to get in the way. I'll do whatever I need to do, mate. But I, uh, course, I, I would like to walk home with a backpack, get up the caves and get a tent out and fucking study the shit out of everywhere. Do you know what I mean? That would be me. <laughs> like, boot up ground, let's get it done kind of approach. But I would be honoured to yes. come out and meet you. And me and you doing the study together, I think, Yes, two, two, two pairs of hands, two minds is far better than one. We could get some serious work done. I mean it because what with what we know with the frequencies, I'm telling you, there's hidden frequencies there, and you only have to find them. And I reckon they gave us little keys to show us it wasn't difficult, they weren't trying to fucking hide it, they're trying to show you. So, I'm gonna they are. I'm, I'm going to perform the test, find that frequency, and I'm going to see whether you're right, whether I can then connect. Do you know what I mean? All of the cave sites, including Kailasa, all, every single one of these cave sites as an identical iconograph, iconographical marker, I would say, which is... It's how would I describe it? If you look at a stupa and its cylindrical body, it has this rounded top, this sphere, this half spherical top. Yeah. At every single one of these sites littered on the outsides of the caves and actually littered across the, the, the outer site itself. But you'll find tend to be a lot of them that comprise up the major, the major complexes is this iconographical signage that shows this this rounded half circle that almost looks like the um, Omega, the Omega symbol. And it actually looks almost identical to the Omega symbol, but at the top, it, it, it narrows out to a tiny little pyramid, but it's all, it's all perfect in its, in its design. And you see this exactly the same design, that's not a, just in all a, that's those. That's an Egyptian sun god, Mark, uh -huh. as well, that is. Dude, dude, even yeah. at the, um, 
you know the Barra Barra caves? It's the one that shows the inside room that's perfectly smooth. It's all granite. The rooms and the ceiling are all perfectly yeah. smooth. This is in Tamil Nadu, right? That door, that door that's there, if you look on the outside of the door, it has exactly the same marker, the iconographical mar Isn't marker. It the snake? It's, it's like a dragon, it's like two dragons in it. They look like dragons. It, it almost looks it almost looks like if you were to look at it, it almost looks like a circular tent. In, and I say that it's not a tent, but it almost looks like this half spherical dome that has a slight point on the top of it. Oh, and no. there tends to be some sort of marking around it. I'll, I'll show you some, I'll send you some photos so you know what I'm talking about. But they're, they're littered across every single site. Kailasa, Ajanta, Allure, or the entire Allura complex, the Elephanta Caves, the, Dubai, the Canary awesome. Caves, all of them do. So I suspect that's, that's a marker of what these the potential of these sites are and i i don't know entirely what the marker represents admittedly but when i look at it and from my observations i suspect it has something to do with either acoustics piezoelectricity general energy frequency sound x y and z they can all represent this they yeah. can all represent the same thing in a visual representation like you can take it in a few different ways but they all those um, all those aspects are there so <clears throat> i tend to find yeah all good man i um i tend to find it quite a phenomenal thing to see the same architectural designs playing out not just in the structure of these sites but also in that iconographical markings let's say um you know and i think this idea that there can't possibly be me. There ca cannot possibly be one set of builders that have just gone out and just, you know, built these sites for some random reason. That doesn't, that doesn't sit well with me personally. I know it doesn't sit well with you, and I know it doesn't sit well with a lot of people who are no. really into like this. That's that are really into this idea of ancient history. So. Yeah, I, I think those markers are a good indicator um, of what those sites are intended to be. And as I said, a lot of these sites, and I, I would, if I'm to be brave and brazen, I'm going to say every single one of these sites aren't complete. They're not complete. Some of them are more closer to that line of completion than others, e easily noticeable. But every single one of these sites from, from Gujarat to Madhya Pradesh to Maharashtra to Odisha to Tamil Nadu, all the way across this across this central belt of India where these sites have been built, it doesn't sit well with me for the mainstream historians to have this idea that, oh, there was just a bunch of like random builders that came into existence one day and they just like subs they just coincidentally built all these sites irrespective of the fact that they all show identical signs of not just architecture and the layouts, but also also to the finite details of the sites, whether that's the pinch holes, whether that's these, and I've seen them at a few of these sites, admittedly, I, I've seen them at Kailasha as well. There's these square markings, like these square cutouts that are on walls. And these square cutouts have got like four to five holes punched into them. Now, I can't find anything on the Archaeological Survey of India's records about this, but when I look at it and I asked a construction, a friend of mine in construction, and I also asked my brother, who's in demolition, about these particular markings. And what I got back from both of them is they look like bolting systems for, for hauling during excavation. So what essentially happens is there's holes that are drilled into a large piece a large mass in this case like a big boulder of, of granite or basalt and then there's a metal plate that's planted in on that that holds onto these bolts and then it has a looping system on it that then you thread in let's say like a steel cable in modern times that allows you to haul out massive amounts of rock that you don't need because you're excavating away from the site correct wow. so these are also lit so these are also littered across the site so then i go okay they're excavating massive amounts of rock with machinery that we do. Huge amounts, too. Huge amounts. There's well and truly, in my mind, just from the sites that I've seen, there's well and truly over like 5,000 tons of rock 
that has just been hauled and removed. And they're not even, it's not even like the rock's just been removed. The rock's gone. It's, it's disappeared. Gone. It's either, it's gone. It's either, it's either been repurposed for building temples, which I suspect, I suspect in the past that it has been because there's a lot of sites in Gujarat where these ancient sites around these ancient cave systems and, and step wells, where the moguls literally dismantled them and, and, these have all got intricate carvings in the rock, right? Because they were used for the walls of temples and whatnot. And they've been put up in, in, in walls that have surrounded sites from like the Mughal reign where they've literally just built walls. They've dismantled sites and then taken that rock and then put that into walls. So in Patan, where Rani Kivau is, the queen step well, which everyone sees is that reverse temple, that upside down temple, <clears throat> that's surrounded by a massive, a massive wall that stretches I think it's like a six kilometer wall that stretches around this massive site and, and the Queen Stepwell sits in the middle. But around the Queen Stepwell is there's all ruins of temples and everything that used to be there. But all those blocks that comprised up of those temples are now in the wall. So you walk along these these massive gates, there's um, 18 gates that comprise up this massive wall and you can just walk from gate to gate and you just see all these blocks that are in the wall that have just been rudimentarily put in there. And that is just in one place that's not even accounting for the rest of india where this has happened to as well so it's a bit of a shame that those things have obviously happened but i'm glad that the most ancient sites that are in india still remain because those sites have obviously been the most hardest to dismantle because basalt granite quartz and yeah. like you mentioned like if we look at Aurangzeb, like the the the, the, the mogul ruler um from gosh from like 1300 sort of AD to 1400 AD, I guess, like Arangzeb, I think it was around that time period. My years are probably off, but he was the one that sent out people to the Kailasa temple complex to dismantle it, right? They couldn't, much like the other sites. And yes, there has been some damage done, like you had mentioned. And you know what's interesting, dude? A lot of these sites, and I know we talked about the geopolymers only briefly, is a lot of these sites actually have iron and or steel frameworks, scaffolding, not scaffolding, um, the frames that are put in before you lay a concrete inside them. So outside the Kala caves and outside the Canary caves, where there's massive pillars are. Seen pictures of it. It looks like an up to date basically scaffold system it really does when you're walking up and that, around it you, you can see it's huge you can see pictures of it online they're in but these things are inside the rock bro so the rock's actually broken away from these pillars and you can actually see the iron yeah. scaffolding that's inside the rock how is that and possible? it's at all the sides how is that fucking Look, this is why i think that's and i don't i don't believe all the sites from all the sites that I've been to, they all have the same telltale signs. But this is why I mentioned about the degree of separation of the construction, the original construction yes. versus yeah. the restoration that took place. I do believe that the Pandavar brothers and the Mahabra, they their their lineage, their dynasty, or at that time there was there was a technology that involved the use of creating these geopolymers because at every single site the color distribution of the rock is slightly different, but what's been, what's I've noticed is really interesting is that these geopolymers or these, these concretes or these plasters that have been applied, they actually take, they actually take on the properties of the surrounding rock. They actually end up looking like the real McCoy, the stuff that's actually been carved out of the mountain. And that's why I referenced Marcel because what he's done, the work that he's done, and I know he's only done rudimentary work so far, but his results are quite promising, is that you're mixing this wood ash, this sodium this sodium carbonate, this natron, this salt, and then they're mixing the granules of particular rock types, maybe from those areas, and creating these plasters to apply. But that's come later. That's not from the original construction period. So that on its own is already a very unique property. That on its own is already very unique in the idea of construction methods. But the original implications of these, these sites from these ancient builders, let's say, man, they just knew some things that, they seriously just knew some things that I don't even know if modern academia are even ready for, because this idea that 
we right now are like the best version that humanity has ever been, right? We're like the best of the best because I have a device that allows me to take naughty photos of myself and send it to someone on the other side of the planet. Doesn't Therefore, it make you the sick? Best of the best. Doesn't it make you sick? It, it makes me question the <laughs> idea of human consciousness. <laughs> well, sure. well said. Like well, <laughs> well, you're, you're far nicer. But to I it. can't wait, bro. You're far nicer to present humans than I would be. I, 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 I'll tell you what it is, Fuzzy, and like, I'm just speaking to you personally now, rather than an audience. If you get me, um, I, when I fell in love with India, I've studied, I study the world. That's period. I study the architecture. I study this. You know me. I'm the stonework king. It's what I do. But when I started studying India on its entirety once i started i haven't I, I simply haven't been able to stop to date and i'm still nowhere near well actually i'm lying i feel like i am getting somewhere now i really do feel like that's been an excellent conversation i i think your experiences are backing up where i think i need to be and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I think that you could take me to the places where I could do the testing together with you. Me and you could be like that, arms round each other going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. In fact, look, because you don't control mountain ranges with hydrology unless you are wanting mineralogy to act for you. And archaeoacoustics, India isn't just 1%. It's a hundred percent archaeoacoustics they 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 were using it as a like and i will say it to you it, it is a technological aspect because we're just putting it together right now if if it was fair health and communicate we're opening doorways no pun intended when we go there say we get the frequency right and we walk in there and we're like oh i feel amazing well you actually get that I could change that frequency up a bit more. Oh, I feel amazing. And then I could change it down. Oh, my God, I've got to get out of here. That's what they were going for. Because then, say you could give a feeling of fear and you had a town. Say you surrounded it with, like, Galatrian Italy is like this. And it's surrounded with Cyclopean-style stonework. So you've got your city behind this wall. What if, when all the temples were connected, if you had it basically to a feeling of fear to those that weren't attuned or in harmony in, in um, how, how would you look at it in archaeoacoustic term, your frequency wasn't correct for the area you were going in. You as an army might only get to the woods. You aren't getting anywhere near it because those woods are telling you, don't come anywhere closer because you're going to die. And you're like, I can't go any closer. Look, this is, I'm explaining it as I would as a bit of a laugh and a joke, but I'm being genuine. I've, on the studies, Vikings went to Ireland and it was just the sound of the wind. They, they took solace in a room that they shouldn't. And basically, mate, they went insane. They never got their minds back again. They, they simply couldn't get their heads back on board. I just think they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I think that was prevalent. And I think if you went anywhere near Indian temples back in the day and you weren't attuned to that area, likewise the plateau, which I think was a base note for the entire fucking lot of it, mate. I really do think about 900 kilometres away, which is the movement of stone, believe it or not, that we keep hearing. I think it was connected subterraneanly. I think we got a vacuum and took away the sands. I think all of it is subterranean. It's so, so fucking like everything is subterranean. Subter We're all looking at what's above. It's what's below that's actually the most important thing, the cave systems, the water. I bet you if we did, we'll do what we'll prove this. You do the testing in the actual temples, you know, like where you said about the whisper, that, that'd be perfect. But if you go to the hypogeum of that and did the testing, mate, me and you'd be like, oh, my God. You could get it to the point. I think that they were changing the frequency just by little bits. And 
the people around them were great but you go and fuck with me and i'll change it a little bit and you ain't getting nowhere near me imagine you were the only faction that knew that technology alexander the great when he inherited the army of his dad philip he only had three years look at what he did look at what he did no you you aren't kicking the shit out of all of what he did no i suggest he was going and functionalizing temples and basically getting rid of the bullies and telling everyone i'm here to look after you he wasn't warring with everyone nah he was trying to help you he was saying i'm helping you i'm getting the temples turned back on we're gonna live like kings and if he'd have lived a bit longer seriously because he was a party animal he got pissed he shagged birds he couldn't help his fucking self like any man and he ended up dying an early death and then his powers basically went off to rogue generals that didn't really know what he knew i don't personally i think there's been attempts attempts at what the institute and you are, are attempting to pull off i think there's people out there that have written papers that have been this close they are just so scared to publish the results i couldn't give a fuck about what other people think i want to do it for fucking me and then i'll know and then once the results are there i'll be like well i'll publish it or i don't care whether you believe it or not because i had the boots on ground my brain connect i want to connect fuzzy to it's going to sound stupid i meditate i train three hours a day i'm fucking like on it cpo intelligence analyst that's my job swimming instructor too my job job as in what i have to do in normal life around that i am in the ancient world all the fucking time i live there and it's because mate i'm telling you we are so fucking close at breakthroughs right now with the teams that we've got and i really do think the boots on ground work that yourself has done really i think it's actually fucking magical mate i think what you found is brilliant second to none like well done really really good it, 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 what you've said actually makes our research work it's like ah, we're we're bang on with back you're you're confirming without knowing it exactly what we've been thinking as well by seeing it amazing amazing dude it's it's incredible man and you know like i know i post up photos and occasional videos and stuff of you know my experience this stuff and i've got the youtube videos up but um like it doesn't do it justice you know when i was at the baja caves and the Arangabad caves i got footage and i didn't adjust the audio i thought i'd just put in the raw footage into those specific specific scenes where i happened to go into these rooms and even the microphone on the gopro picks up the re reverberation that happens in these rooms it doesn't it doesn't distort the sound but you can clearly hear that there is this massive reverberation effect that takes place and you know what's really funny that you mentioned earlier when we were discussing about the destruction or the dismantling of some of these sites all those rooms across the caves that i've been to that the moguls had gone to in the past to to dismantle these cave systems and these chachi halls and these vamanas and you know like these hindu hindu sites and these jain sites and these buddhist sites in general is all the rooms that have this reverberation effect even the ones that have got sculptures in them right so like we're talking idol worship now they're not touched and i think they're not touched for a very good reason because when you go into these rooms just speaking causes this these acoustic properties to begin activating so i can only imagine when you've got a couple of people in these rooms and they're trying to dismantle something and they're talking amongst themselves about the specific angles they're going to target the rock at to dismantle them the fact that the reverberation happens and knowing from personal experience at these sites you can't stay in these rooms very long unless in some of these rooms are very long unless and i suspect unless you're going into those rooms to do a very specific thing whether that is for some sort of ethereal use or some sort of spiritual use or whether that is for a communicative use or whether this is you know to to have some sort of healing benefit on the body through like this ultrasound frequency reverberation effect that's taking place you can insert x y and z whatever that you know whatever you want but the fact remains that you can go into these sites and a lot of these rooms where there is idols inside these rooms these sculptures that have been carved into the walls 
they're untouched. And I suspect it is because you go into these rooms and you start to feel this vibration and this vibrational effect that happens from constant vocalization in these rooms. It does distort you, dude. Me and my partner, we went into one of the rooms. Dude, we couldn't be in that room for any more than 10 seconds because even just saying one word, it would echo in the room for like three seconds, man. And it would literally start messing with me. Yeah, like I get cold, I get chills down my spine and everything. But that effect became um, it became very um. How would you just how would I refer to it as? It almost it almost and I've experienced this before, so I got a rough idea in terms of that feeling. It almost felt like the initial stages before you hit vertigo, where your brain cannot distinguish between what's on the ground and what's above it's like it's become Man, it's almost saying, like it's you're saying what we discussed before basically that you were getting a feeling of fear and you get the fuck yeah, out yeah, yeah for sure it. yeah like simple as and that's all down to i think that may, mainly these temples are actually like I, I hate to use the word set at but could be calibrated at using look i'm telling you now i think hydrology was the main factor of it Fars, I think that that was the the pressure in the water in different levels, and especially now you've said in India that it was even down to a smaller level around it. I get that that's the sanitation, and people all say no, that's bollocks. No, I say that's bollocks because they knew how to get water. They're not they're not ridiculous. Do you know what I mean? They knew how to get water. This is to where you're building it in behind temples and using it as a as an ecosystem for our few acoustics frequency. And 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 literally the the well the amplification of that. Now, if you are if you are incorporating that into the engineering schematic of a building using RQ acoustics, you're something special as a builder. Now if you were going to do that, Fuzzy, you, in, in the mainstream dating set that we're getting, they would have had to have built all of this in such a small amount of time. I just don't get that. I just don't see it. I mean, these cave systems are miles and miles and miles long. It, it needs planning and coincidence needs planning. You just... You know, you'd need huge machines to move that in a small space of time. You, you couldn't do it with people power, mate. Just not happening. Or you could, no, but you no. need time. Oh, absolutely. That's why I said, like, this idea of these builders, like, sort of building out this long-term plan over many, many generations to get these things done, whether it's 500 years or 1,000 years. But another thing that's popped to mind that I haven't mentioned yet um, is the tectonic, the evidence of tectonic activity across all these sites. So one of the things that's in the ancient Hindu texts, I forgot which one, I think it's in the Mahabharata, <coughs> references to when Dwarka actually sinks into the ocean is due to an earthquake. Now, how this earthquake happened or not is a different discussion. Some refer to the, 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 the Shiva crater, which is in the Arabian Peninsula, which is off the coast of Dwarka. And if it is that, and that is what has caused this, this earthquake that allowed Dwarka to sink into the, into the ocean, into the shores, that earthquake has had a rippling effect across central India because of all these sites that I've been to, and Kailasa is no exception, there is definitive proof of tectonic faults that have taken place from what I suspect to be earthquakes or one massive earthquake that took place because you'll tend to find across all the sites, there's these massive splits, these massive tectonic faults that have essentially ripped open sections of basalt and granite that litter across the sites and including at some of the sites like Canary Caves, for example, and the Kala Caves, is the stupas actually have these, these tectonic faults that are actually in the actual stupa itself. And that's not from damage of someone chiseling away or trying to hack at it to get a weak spot to cause the splitting. You can you can tell a genuine fault, tectonic fault from someone that's actually trying to chisel away at the rock because there's a definitive markings of people actually trying to break the rock where this is just a flat split, like it's almost separated. So that's across all a ton of the sites, actually all the sites that I've been to, but the fault hasn't impacted all of the 
the sculptural works, whether that's the stupas or whether that's the, you know, sort of sculptures of, of Buddha or of Shiva or of any of the other sculptures. Some have had that damage from faults. Um, so I, I suspect that when you take that into account, that the fact that this line of tectonic activity exists across this central, this central section of India, they are from, you know, in some respect from all the same time. And if you take that idea of this tech, this, this sort of earthquake happening, which supposedly happened, you know, well and truly over 7,000 years ago, and look, uh, geologists and some of the samples that have been dredged up from the Shiva crater in the Arabian Peninsula have like dated to like 10 million years. I don't know if that's the case. I think it's probably something from much sooner than that. You know, if we talk about the Younger Dryas period, what may have happened, whether it was a asteroid, a, an asteroidal impact, like a global asteroidal impact, or whether it was something that caused the, the planet's sort of mechanisms to short circuit, let's say, and cause like faults across the planet, whatever it might have been. But these are showing signs of tectonic activity across all of them. On top of, as you had mentioned, the hydrological aspects, which is mind blowing to me when you think about the fact that these builders carved into mountains and into hill lines and into plateaus to such a finite degree that they knew specifically where the bodies of water were and avoided breaking into those underground reservoirs in order to utilize, as you mentioned, these bodies of water that are in the mountains that's, that they've essentially built temples into that are within these confines of where these bodies of water are to amplify these acoustic effects. And it's you can see it across all of the sites, dude. And it's not just that. You know, people go like, oh, well, this is for seasonal drinking water. Sure, yes, there are aquifers outside of these sites that fill up with seasonal monsoon rain. But explain to me the ones that are in the back there that you can't see, but they're there. Like yeah, as well that you'll like. And mm. what I'm going to do is take you on a northern trip from India, and we're going to go up over the Himalayas, and we'll just go down into China, and we're going to go to Longview Caves. Now, Longview Caves was discovered by a fisherman and his daughter or son or whatever. And as you know, all the water got pumped out of it. But remember that at the beginning, all the water got pumped out of it. Now, if we look into the bottom of it, I'm not talking about the carvings, I'm talking about the arches. Those arches are almost like perfect well, aquifer lines. And then when you do the measurements, I'm telling you, when I did the research for my China video and Long Yu, they've got it to a point mate where it's laser perfect i'm talking we would not be able to get it as now we're talking precision engineering here. i get it that china's across the himalayas but china and india have always been very close in architecture in my opinion and where you see rock disappearing like yang shan like you do i get it that architecture you know emperor's palaces need building and things like that and stones get moved for opposite operations it's a very good point however i mean we'll re reverse back to india now when you see just how closely these architectures are matched with just how perfect these subterranean aquifers, cave systems that are, that, that are definitely old in water was my point in bringing Long you there and built to an absolute perfect schematic, might I add. Carvings are perfect. I'm not having it, it's chiseling either. I'm just not. It looks chisel, but it's not. It's not. You've got to know what you're looking at. And it, it looks sort of saw and who knows what they could or couldn't power if piezo electricity was very prevalent we just do not know how much power they could run i mean egyptians had baghdad batteries we know that we know that it was lit up at night because they didn't just work for 12 hours these people or did they get the pyramids up without working in the dark no again you had fires but come on come on what was Baghdad batteries all about? Why were they hidden for so long? I mean, piezoelectric is a thing. Granite is a thing. So is quartz. When you apply 
said equations we get in piezoelectric. Load bearing is very important. Agreed with your summarization of that. And what we see around the ancient world is 100% that. So if we apply to what we're saying, if there's water anywhere near you, if you've got heavy stone and quartz, there's argue acoustics very prevalent into what's going on, you know? And it's, and it's, it's crazy, it's quite, dude. Like it, all, a lot of these sites and like the Nasser Caves is a great example of it, is on a lot of these pillars that are carved out of the same rock, so like basalt or granite, at the tops of these um, like load bearing pillars that I suspect in some degree, not at all of them, but in some of the cave systems, they're definitely just load bearing pillars. Some of the internal pillars, I'm still figuring those things out because, you know, like the Nasser Caves, for example, there's internal pillars in one of the Chatsya halls that has a massive Buddha in the back. And that, and that Buddha is like 15 meters tall, but it's sitting down. And when you, and I'm six, I'm six one, yeah, I'm just shy of six one. But when you stand next to it, Buddha's knee is up to my head and he, and the Buddha is actually sitting down. But outside that room, and that room has crazy acoustics, but outside that room is all these load-bearing pillars. And the structures and the designs and the intricate carvings on the pillars are exactly the same as the pillars inside the Kailasa temple. Bear in mind, there's a 200, almost a 200-kilometre distance between these sites. But all of them have the same thing. You tend to find the same details. And at Nasik, on the outside of the outside rooms or the, 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 the pillars that are on the, the, the facades of these, these temple halls or these vamanas, chachis or vamanas, at the tops is animals. And one of the con consistent animals that you see is elephants. And the same is at the Kala Caves and the Elephanta Caves, etc., is where the tusks are meant to be is this tiny little drill holes that are actually bedded into the tusks. And the fact that they're so tiny, so imagine like where my finger is, this is the dimensions of the actual tusk. And the hole is, is, is so finite. And all I can think to myself when I see these particular, particular drill marks on such a finite piece of rock is the actual drill bit or the actual drill or the RPM, sorry, that has to go into that it has to be ridiculously fast because if it goes in and it's too slow, when it's when it's actually carving this hole, what's going to happen? It's going to splinter the rock around it. It needs to be high powered and fast in such a degree that it's able to puncture a hole, drill a hole and pull back out without fracturing the crystalline structure of the basalt that surrounds that hole. Because as I said, if you come in too slowly, it will cause fractures. That's what will happen. So the fact that those are there as well is also another addition to this whole idea that these sites are from a completely different time period. Um, but yeah, man, like it's it's been a while ride right, going to these sites, bro. It's been nuts. No worries. No worries. <clears throat> right the only i'm just going to talk to you from a, a general point of view on just those holes at the moment the only way mm. i can see that possible is if say you could make the stone malleable have a rod into it as it's hardened you pull it out and you give the appearance that you've drilled into it but you actually haven't because you're able to use archaeoacoustics to enable um well a frequency we should say really and the application of frequencies and how to do this at yet we're not quite 100 percent sure you know <laughs> but i i agree i agree but then uh, the the part where my brain goes to in this particular point of discussion is all the bore drills, all the bore, bore drill markings that I've seen across all these sites. So there's definitive use of some sort of. Now, obviously, for obviously for lack of a better term, I can't obviously solidify this idea that those drills, those bore drill marks, 
I used from some sort of high revolution machine that actually drills those in. But the fact that these sites have these bore drill markings that are as old as the rock that's been excavated, and there's no reference to these on any of the archaeological survey of India's archives when it comes to the nature of restoration plans and excavation work that's that's come in later. Because the only workings that you can find on the site in modern times that the ASI actually have in, in their archives of, of documentation is purely just on the accessibility to the sites. So like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, like maybe an hour and a half ago now, maybe two hours ago now, is like the layering of like staircases and stuff like that in order to actually get into these sites. So the accessibility, the modern stuff, it's there. It's 100% obvious because it's crap, for lack of a better term. The actual materials they've laid down break down. It's very crap concrete. You know, the rocks they're using are very weak rocks. They're like bits of cement they've essentially molded to look like rocks. They fall apart. You know, there's like, um, a, a, what do you call it? Like the, um, the, pl the pipe tubing, the plastic, um, uh, I forgot, like the poly, poly, the, uh, those plastic tubes people use in like housing plumbing systems and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, the ASI, like they've laid those out in particular sections for grabbing excess water flow to channel that because, you know, sections of the that original site have been damaged. And yeah. yeah, so there's all that, but that's obvious that that's new. But the the original construction versus the first stage of restoration, I would call it, they're very distinct. They're very distinct, but you can't tell that distinction unless there's verifiable evidence which i'm happy to say i have put up on my twitter profile and it's obviously verifiable on the youtube videos as well because i actually show you the gradient lines where this where the original rock's been carved from and i and i'm with you on the idea of the carving just fyi like in terms of using the chisels as opposed to using acoustics to soften the material to basically scoop away at it and that's very obvious at four out of like the 10 sites that I've been to. And admittedly, as I said, the Allura cave system, I only saw Kailasa, so I didn't see the other 109 cave systems because that's literally, you got to spend three days there, bro. Like it is crazy. But at the Nasi caves- I want to do that. 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 I can't wait. I can't <laughs> wait to take that. In, in that. In that 22nd cave or the 21st cave at the, at the Nasi caves, when you walk in on the wall to the right, you can actually see the melting marks of this or what looks like a molding mark of the stone. Like it looks like how some people would see those scooping marks that people see in Egypt. I don't yeah. think they're scooping marks. I, I don't believe they're scooping marks. They're, but they show the definitive sign that there has been some sort of technique that's been applied to essentially change the molecular structure or the, the crystalline structure of the basalt of the granite in order to um in order to uh, to sculpt it to shape it to mold it to whatever use it needs to be so that yeah 100 and that's there bro that's their plain as day and it was funny when you mentioned earlier about your friends and how they didn't really know about like the sort of intricate workings of these sites because you go to any of these bro you go to kailasa 99% of the people there, and as I said, I spent the whole day there, and I'm generally a pretty observant guy, and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out of my own, not out of my depth, but I'm out of my cultural norm at these sites, yeah, like I was the only, I was the only white guy there as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure there might have been a couple of others throughout the day, but I must have been in and around at any given moment like at least ten thousand people at any given moment and out of the vast bulk of people that were at this site and much like the other sites even though less people at the sort of other sites everyone's just doing TikToks, instagram selfies like i get it i get the appeal right but behind all that what they don't show you is the is the actual construction methods and at kailasa and i didn't mention it earlier in one of the rooms, so when you're looking at the southern side of the complex, in some of these rooms, the actual ground is molded and there's these H-shaped 
almost like these H-shaped blocks, not even blocks, they're like H-shaped markings. They're referred to, I believe, in some areas, and I know they're referred to this in Rani Kivau at the Queen's Setwell in Bataan as dovetail clips, as these markings put into the rock that have, um, at Rani Kivau they say it was teak wood, which holds the blocks together under like duress so the blocks the, the sorry the teak the wood swells when water hits it and the way these 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 um dovetail clips are carved into the rock is essentially to pull two blocks together when the wood swells due to water and that's to essentially keep the structure rigid to keep it to keep its tensile strength to keep its rigidity stable for thousands and thousands of years because when it's not monsoon season the the bricks the blocks begin to slightly separate and when the water comes in and fills up these massive aquifers some are already filled some are not filled anymore runny kivau is a great example of it people walk down those steps but that whole thing used to be covered up and completely filled in with water that's not like a temple it's not an upside down temple it's like the mainstream historians placate it to be it's not that at all it's just an intricate step well that has many different layers for filling up with water during seasonal rains. And then, of course, it's got its massive underground aquifer that's always full of water. But at all these sites, you can see these dovetail clips and, and Kailasa temples, no exception. So there's multiple layers of building and construction design that has gone into this. And this isn't just downward, downward um downward excavation this is outwards excavation this well, is this excavation to me, Rick, that they've gone a step further then and they're not yeah. just yeah. only selecting a site and doing what we've said we're then placing huge tanks of water sitting tanks of water everywhere else that we then can pressurize water out to initiate or let's say start temples if need be and then yada yada communication blah 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 continue i I actually think we're getting close here. I don't think we're too far away from being able to run some tests on what we're saying. I, you know, this going to sound ridiculous. You said about all the TikToky crap and all that bollocks. My thing would be, so I've looked at all I need to look at the KLS attack, but don't get me wrong. I would be fucking an absolute hero worshiping the place. Uh, it's one of my favourite sites in the world, and I would spend some serious fucking time idolising it. But, but my thing would be right. Here's the equipment. I'm going to set up. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do here, here, here. I would have all my day planned on where to get testing done on that place, and because it's an opportunity, in my opinion, and I would go north as well, over the top to that other temple and look at all the other temples and run tests in there and see whether we get similar frequencies. I'm willing to bet all of that system is running off exactly the same frequency even today, without a shadow of a doubt. How do you feel, how do you feel about night trekking? I'm up for anything, mate. I love backpack on, <laughs> it on do you know what I mean? So it's a lot weird. of these sites I'm up for anything, mate. I do, these... I do, I do um, yeah, I do the Antarctic mission with you if I could train for it. I really oh, love, I love to go that. there, mate. It floated my boat when you said that. I love fucking training. I'll tell you something now, mate. That the answers that you could find there, because I'm telling you now, I know where we, we both know where we'd be going. You know what I mean? I, I don't I wouldn't take no prisoners, I want to fucking see what's happening, you know what I mean. The answers are there, aren't they, you know? But I think realistically, and we've got a good base with you actually being there, which is fucking ace. Uh, I think we could do some damage on the testing on some of these temples. And Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to it, mate. Honestly, my heart's going like, oh, I've got a contact in India. Can't wait to fucking hit it. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I love my ancient sites. I do get excited. I, I, with, I'm more excited now than I ever have been because I know what I'm doing when I'm there. I'm, I do get that whole, wow, this is amazing, but I'll have that for about 10 minutes and then let's fucking get it on. And I want to work. I want to work. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to wow, wow, wow. 
I want to work, 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 and what's this and what's that? And I'll be like, fuzzy, 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 look, 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 we'll find this, we'll find that. We take a sample of that, we're taking this, we're backpacking everything. But I'll probably take about 20 or 30 sample bags and we'll take loads of samples along our way that we can get tested. I want to see what that, that goo is big time, like big time. Well, there's plenty, there's plenty of, um, there's plenty of mineral uh, mineral testing labs all across India in all the major cities. Even in some of the smaller towns, you tend to find them. The universities so, are amazing. Yeah, not even not even just not even just the universities, dude. Like any anywhere, there's there's lab there's mineral testing facilities all over the place because oh wow, like in, India is actually a massive exporter of um, bentonite clay, which is like a volcanic clay that's you know comes out of like the Indus Valley region and stuff like that. It's a massive exporter of it because it's widely used in the mining industry for making like slurries for actually drilling drilling deep so naturally and this stuff extends all across india as well there's, there's mineral testing facilities everywhere so there's no issue with getting any testing done the reason the reason i mentioned about the night trekking so the archaeological survey of india they don't really have like a lot of security set up and it's generally like during the day but all these sites all of these sites you can access from multiple directions it's not just the stock standard go up through no, the gate, through the gate. Enter. yeah we've got yeah this. you can yeah. get in you can get in through so many different ways like kailasa temple like the Ellora cave system once you get up on that plateau which is very easy to do mind you it's not a challenge at all like it's actually a very breezy walk to get up on that you got to go outside of the kailasa temple complex you walk like 500 meters down the road you go behind the the, the set section of shops that are set up and you just walk up the hill bro and you just walk up around and bang you're on top of kailasa like kailasa temple at 6 p.m they ring the bell and then they start ringing the bell and everyone's got to get they finally can, close it by about 7 30. can you get a camp anywhere or could we hire a car and get a car so we can well i don't care so I'll what, what I'll we'd have to do what what we'd have to do is we'd have to night trek up yeah. onto the hill and then we could not we could do that in the afternoon set up a campsite there because north uh, sorry west above the kailasa temple that's not the archaeological survey of india's site that's just like central central government land essentially and that's you can just not chill. looked at at all you can just chill out there dude and there's a massive extension of riverway there that has been carved out like i mentioned earlier in the podcast this is all this is a man-made cut river or water channel system that connects up to aquifers higher up in the hill and you can just set up shop and there's walkways that allow you to get from up there down to the Kailasa temple. So you could oh, essentially wow. get down there during the night. There'd be no security at the temple. I don't know if there'd be security at the temple, but I highly doubt it. Like once the doors are closed, once everyone's out, generally everyone's out. There's not really a lot to do. And I'd be interested to see the acoustic properties of a site like that yeah, with nobody's to. around. So well, because it's difficult to it's it's difficult to do a lot when there's people there. And to be completely frank with you, if you wanted to have access of that scale where you're actually testing stuff, man, you've got to fork up some big bucks to the ASI because they're more than happy for people to go and do tests, but they're just like, give me some money. Give me some money and I'll let you do whatever you want. But they charge erroneous amounts. I think to do like f photography, well, video well, I can footage. take a laptop shadily on there and flip my laptop up and start doing shit. There, right? Oh, you can take it in. Like you can wear your backpack in there and like, Dude, I brought in my phone. I brought in a couple of tools with me and just did some rudimentary testing at some of these sites without issue. Like I brought my um my level meter to check the level to see if like particular sculptures and that are perfectly level and a lot of them are, you know, my compass. I mean, I used my phone, my iPhone as the compass, obviously. But I even like straight marks. I've got like a LIDAR on it, so ultra scan LIDAR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can like get really close to a stone, take a picture of it. Even if I'm going past it, I'll just video it. Bam, 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 bam. Even if I'm not many, Dude, bam, you bam, can... bam, 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 bam. and then I'll study you know it. What the... Detail, mate. What I got in detail. I, I'm one of them people. I am. If I can't get it properly, I'm getting it shadily, mate. So I'm with you all day on. Let's fucking 
in it, mate. You can record anything, bro. It's funny because they've got a, all the sites that I've been to. They've all got rules about videography. Like no, it says like no cameras, essentially. Like no, no recording, no camera recording. But that's under the condition that you actually have like, like full on like recording cameras and stuff used in film and yeah, proper equipment. But people are in there with their phones all the time, bro, taking videos, taking photos. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. They're just looking at it as like, is this for, is this for cinematography production? If yes, like, and you actually want to bring that I'd equipment. be able to do it on a level, seriously, with my iPhone. Hmm. Yeah, I, easy, I, easy bro. Able to, I've got olders fucking where we could look like we're taking a fuck, mate. I've got fucking badass little little fucking gadgets that will make our life <laughs> perfect <laughs> where I know I can get on site, set up a little tripod, take photos. We've got a little turning, moving thing. Yeah, I've yeah, got yeah. All sorts of stuff that, like, we get, look, like, what we'll do, we'll do, like, one survival pack, one pack of all our stuff. I might... Be- I might be able to get us permission. So that that person that I mentioned earlier, that XMLA, yeah. Satish Patel, him and me are actually good friends now. Like we follow each other. We occasionally chat. He's always like the next time, you know, you come to Mumbai, tell me, I'll send a car to pick you up. You know, he wants to show me because he's told me there's heaps of these ancient cave systems that have never been touched by the archaeological survey of India. There's hundreds of them littered across central India especially in Maharashtra, that all connect to the riverways, like in Gujarat, and Saraswati River. It's like an archaeoacoustic communication system. Yeah, yeah, for sure. On a huge degree, mate. Like, we could have found the fucking, uh, I don't know what they call it in Australia or India, but in England we call it, like, say, BT or whatever, Virgin Media Sky or whatever the fuck it might be. We literally could be finding how they were communicating properly, and I think it was through these underground. Look, now, the more you're saying that it's huge, there, as in huge, they're not. These aren't hypogeums. These are massive aquifer systems with enormous seafaring uh, hypogeums. You know, and. It's, the, 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 the potential now of what I'm thinking has gone through the roof. I'm actually like, fuck, India really has got well, and that you've backed up everything I've ever thought, really. I I thought it was a communication hub, I really did, or an engineering hub. And that's how it screams out to me. It was just producing engineer after engineer after engineer after engineer. Like, fucking, what the fuck was going on in ancient India? Baffles me. But you've got universities, schools of learning. You've got Warangal we haven't even talked about, which is a mixture of all sorts of different... What the fuck is going on there? There's ornate columns and posts that are, like, taller than the... They've got nubs on the bottom of them as well, which... When this, when that, when that temple, I mean, it looks like it's been hit by a fucking meteorite. To be quite honest, if you look at where angle, it just looks like it's been decimated. When that site was whole, you're looking at a true kingdom palace, like an absolute palace, bro, of ornate magicalness. I don't know whether you've studied it, but. It's gorgeous where angle is. It's just gorgeous. Well, I'm shocked actually. We haven't talked about War Angle, but um, I just look at some of the things on there, and it's the size, it's the sheer fucking size of it. I mean, you've got like mm-hmm. what look like doors on hinges, bro. But I mean, it makes Greek doors look like fucking small little, they are massive. And like, honestly, I've studied the details of this. Check this out, right? You've got Shikanas engraved in the middle and then you've got deities around that then around that you've got more shikanas and then another so, i mean it's like who who was able to do that into these it looks metallic to me when you say shikanas are you do you the way you do it is this like a little pyramidal design yeah it looks like a step that goes up like that and down do and it kind of goes down and up and like that Chicana is a global hallmark, and it, it, it figures that's, into the room a hell of a lot. But that's it. Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. That's it. That's actually at the Baja Caves, the Arangabad Caves, 
the Nasty Caves as well, but I didn't notice it the first time. I only noticed it when yeah, I went there recently. Like that. Yeah, so um, at the Abaja Caves, the first the time I noticed step, it. Stair Step Hallmark or a Shikana Hallmark, it's called. Well, those those Shikana Hallmarks, the, the tri-banding that I mentioned earlier, which you see you see the tri-banding quite prevalent on the stupas, the Buddha stupas, that cylindrical object. Yeah. At the top of the cylinder, you see that tri-banding before it reaches up to the, 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 the yeah, half spherical yeah. zone that sits on top. You see that tri-banding in all these rooms at these cave sites, and above that tri-banding is you see these shikanas. They're all over the place. But I didn't notice it the first time until I was at the, sorry, not the Baja Caves, the Arangabad Caves. And then I saw it again at the Baja Caves. And then I went back to Nasik. I saw it there as well. I suspect that's at the Alora Caves. I didn't see it on first inspection at the Kailasa well, Monday, but I wouldn't be surprised. You know, the Alora Caves, you know, where you've got, you've basically got the, it's like a doorway and it's like a triple motif doorway and you've got the carvings next to it i think they're big buddhas they're next to maybe buddhas i'm not quite sure but they're right next to it and it looks enormous doorway like you said like a bit of a load bearing carving sort of false door if you want but it's got that triple header effect again another hallmark that we find absolutely everywhere from peru india you name it egypt whatever it's all over the place that is now again it's just another global hallmark, but this time it's in the cave systems, which intrigues me because what we are looking at with the cave systems is pretty much more of the original builders for me, because that was the original where we were going to build upwards because these were the right uh, hypergeums. It's got the right water. We'll be able to manipulate the water here. This is where our site needs to be. So it's almost like they knew from ground up rather than up down i don't suggest they were using you know ground penetrating radar to do this so they were having to mine for the luxury of finding these places find it then work it you know but doesn't that take serious time mining skill how the hell were they mining through mountains to, to find knowing... the before they started the temples that begs Correct. the question I think they use the I think they use like acoustic properties to actually determine to determine what was where. Um and I, I wouldn't be surprised considering the fact that and as I said from earlier on in the podcast, from just my observations at, at these cave systems and, and the acoustic properties, especially when the specific rooms happen to be adjacent to in ground or sorry. Uh, underground but in the walls yeah bodies of water aquifers and then obviously there's the hypergeums as well so the the fact the fact that they knew where to find these bodies of water in hill lines in mountains carve out the mountain right so you need a massive workforce the amount of rock to move and there's no of blueprints there's never been a single trace construction methods of these sites and Earlier, when I mentioned the Indica epigraphic, the the compilation of, of of writings that have taken place over like a you know five hundred years or so of, of exploration from both Portuguese, British, French, Indian explorers themselves, Spanish explorers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that have all gone there. <clears throat> all the historical notes of these sites are all taken from <clears throat> the Brahmi text. That has been carved into these sites so that they they tend to put it in the period of ahsoka right which is that sort of 1500 to 2000 bc period but all the scrawlings and i refer to them as scrawlings these carvings of brahmi text you can tell that they're not from the time period because they're all rudimentary they're not perfectly even comparative to the surrounding art the surrounding sculptures the surrounding architectural designs because they're all perfect they're perfectly straight perfectly they're perfectly spaced out and everything and all these scrawlings that happen to be across these sites talk about tend to talk about the ionians right so the so the greeks the ancient greeks that had ownership and domain over these sites and that these sites were donated at the outcomes of conflict of war um donation to charities donation to buddhists and stuff like that but 
despite all the writings that there is on these sites, there's not a single piece of written history revolving around the construction and excavation methods of any of these sites. None of none at all. Mm. So all the dating that's put on these sites is purely rudimentary dating and is purely based off of a farce of a particular time period where scrawlings were, were essentially etched into the rock and the scrawlings that are etched into the basalt are garbage, man. They're so garbage and you can tell that they're garbage because they're literally put up on a blank piece of wall and then surrounding that blank piece of wall is these beautiful tri-bandings, these beautiful sculptures of Buddha, these beautiful sculptures of like Asura, the devas, the things that are seen as like demons and angels and stuff like that. And these are all perfect, perfect. And there's this like rudimentary scrawling in them. So I, I don't believe any of the dating periods that are put to these sites personally based on that fact. Um, Anyone can write yeah, man. CT on a site. I can I could write <laughs> Phil Bozzi in 99 on the great percent. It doesn't mean that Phil built it, no, does it? So, no, I'm with you on this. And um, mm -hmm. I think what we're actually seeing is a, a, a very large engineering project. Uh, and when I say large, like you said, and we've said earlier on that, coincidence takes planning and you need an hell of, an hell of a big workforce to not a, not only call look it takes master masons to carve these masterpieces i get it but who's the project managers doing the aquifers before the builds to carve out the mountain i mean the mind then starts going wow where were these guys coming from out who was at the top table if you had engineers like that now that begs the point could the blue class have been walking the earth when that happened you know and when the colder conditions were here the colder conditions could have killed them off i mean they might have been using uh snake synthesis for you know like snake venom synthesis for hibernation and things like that but the cold like many has killed off so many different let's just say atomically different humans but it doesn't mean to, I mean, we give no signs that we've been it, like you say, for massive amounts of time because we can't look at the sun. We our skin gets burnt. That goes for every skin colour and creed. We 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 do. We're not like a crocodile that's got armour that basically can live underwater, that can bite with so much pound of pressure, that can eat what he wants. It shows that he's been here and around our bullshit as humans as well and still thrives and dominates in its environment that's a million years animal you know that's a million years creature where i don't and it begs a point like you said about the mobile phone we are capable of doing a lot of things in a hundred years what have we been capable of doing in 350 375 000 it's been pushed back probably a little bit more on that and probably would be Again and again and again, who's the ghost gene at 800,000 years? Blah, 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 blah. So we could go on and on with that. But it does beg the point we haven't been here that long. So to have achieved those temples with that time scale is possible. Of course it is. I'm not saying it isn't. What we don't understand is where that time scale is and who those engineers were. But I think we're getting mightily close with being able to replicate what they were going for that begs the point that one of these rooms could be a room that gives the answers to engineering which actually makes me feel good because you might have a room of learning you might have a room where you go in there and if you then are at that higher learning capability as we've spoken about i think at the right frequency you might be able to exactly that to how to, I don't know, maybe rebuild, reactivate, reuse, do what we need to do with these temples. And that that would be my goal as a human being, if it's possible to do, you know? You know, I'm, have you heard of, I'm sure you've heard of it, the, and I, I don't know if there's any validity to the, to historical references to it. I, and I've only ever heard it referenced, you know, in things like Twitter spaces or YouTube videos and stuff like that. I haven't done a deep dive, but as you were saying, these things, 
a word came to mind about this and i know we spoke earlier about this like reaching a different level like an ethereal level something for knowledge something for learning the akashi records yeah this 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 grand conscious knowledge that everyone is able to tap into like yeah there is that possibility that these sites did have specific rooms that 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 allowed you to reach a specific a specific state in order to like maybe reach this ethereal plane where this this knowledge acquisition could begin to take place that's definitely possible um and a couple of other things i wanted to add before we wrap this up because i know we're pushing on that where we're definitely at the three hour mark now i think we're at the three hour mark we are, um, yeah. and it's been, we, and it's been amazing. For an hour, but i've been enjoying it mate. I've, just <laughs> been on two hours, but I've thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you so uh, it's, mate, oh, i've always been having oh, a you know, like well chat in it so yeah, yeah oh, absolutely i always enjoy having a guy so since i met you since i met you last year phil i've always had a pleasure having a conversation with you man i know it's always been in a room with other people like on twitter spaces and whatnot but either way it's always been a pleasure um the nubs the nubs that you the nubs that you mentioned they're at all the cave sites and it's not just one or two like they're in most of the rooms of the nubs and they actually come out of the wall and the end of the nub is actually um like like a semicircle. So it comes out straight and then it goes into almost like a semicircle, but the, the nub itself is, is flat on the top and bottom. And it's no more than like maybe like one and a half inches in thickness. And these are littered all across the cave sites. And they happen to be all in the rooms where this, this tri-banding is that happens, this same tri-banding that you see on the stupas. At the Nasi Caves, one of the rooms actually shows something that I haven't seen at any other cave sites where the tri-banding actually shows it, it begins to bend and has this effect like it's a wave, yeah. like it, it has this fluid motion. Yeah, it's very interesting. But that's separate. When you had mentioned about the caves, I wanted to make a remark and I had a conversation with someone I met in real life who happens to live in Rishikesh, which is in the state of Uttarakhand, which is in the north. Uttarakhand translates in Sanskrit to the land of the gods. Now, in the northern reaches of Uttarakhand, you're in the, the Himalayas. Essentially, you're in the Himalayas. Yeah. Now, I've been told I've been told that in the, in the northern reaches of Uttarakhand, in the mountains, in the, in the foothills and the mountains of the Himalayas, is there these cave systems that come out of the mountains. Now I've seen these cave systems in, in I know northern, about these. Nasi. I've studied these. Yeah, you're right. You're yeah. Back. So you're right. so these cave systems, supposedly some of these cave systems have hundreds of kilometers going all the way. And bear in mind these and I've seen videos of some of these cave systems. They're the where they come out of the mountain lines, they're the mouths of of rivers essentially. So like you walk into these caves and there's water coming out. Some of these cave systems I've been told extend over a hundred kilometers. And oh. I've been told that there's a couple of these cave systems that connect and actually end up at Mount Kailash. And my, Mount Kailash mm. being the sacred place where supposedly it's of course. And I mean, you've yeah. got the so, city that's underneath that you can, is it the magic supposedly, city? Or go supposedly to, there's a- Supposedly to the mountain. Uh, if there is correct. a secret underground, it's like a, a city for the gods, and if you can make it there, it's like meant to be a utopia of gorgeousness, yeah. basically, is for want of a better word, is it there? I <clears throat> the only things that I know that give some sort of credence to that, obviously there's the Hindu text. It's been written that about the that. Hindus, yeah. It has, yep. The cave systems are incredibly interesting, the fact that they stretch. And obviously these cave systems aren't just in the northern reaches of, of India, they go into the Himalayas. These are all over the place. These are all over central India as well and into Gujarat. Whether you see the cave systems as man-made or natural is irrespective, the fact that that remains that they are there. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if there is something that is at Mount Kailash because of all the conversations that I've had, and there is some, there is some, there is some, I guess, historical text around this, predominantly with the Portuguese and the Mughal empires the that Portuguese happened to go into these. I've heard of this. Yeah, you're right. That the they found that the closer they were getting, the closer they were getting to Mount Kailash, their instruments that showed rudimentary, essentially their magnometers, their, 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 sorry, their, um, 
stops working. It started to fluctuate. Yeah, so moon. Mount Correct. So Mount Kailash actually has a very strong permeating electromagnetic effect. I'm not sure what it is. I don't know if it has something to do with the material of the rock. It could be the fact that the whole mountain might be predominantly comprised up of granite and quartz. That could be playing a yeah. role. Or there's something inside the mountain. Or under. Now, yeah. I, or under the mountain. I, I entertain the idea, and I'll tell you this from personal experience, because when I went to one of the Jotalings in Maharashtra, um, which is right next to Kailasa Temple, and these both of these sites are connected, mind you, because they're only within a kilometre of each other, and the the water, the rock cut, the rock cut channels connect up. That's right. These rock cut channels that connect up to Kailasa. Um, when I went to the Grineshwar, it's referred to as the Grineshwar Jotaling. And you have to, you got to bear in mind when you go to these sites, you've got to go in there with a pretty open mind, first and foremost. So at this particular, at this particular temple site, all the men have to remove their shirts before going into the inner, the inner temple chamber, the actual mandi of the temple where the lingam sits. And it's a very large lingam and it's all made of granite. So you, I took my shirt off, I went in there and you've got like, you know, maybe like 30 people that can fit in there at any given time, let's, you know, referred to as devotees. And when I got in there, I noticed not immediately, but there just happened to be a moment, a moment where everyone was quiet. You know, those, those interesting moments, you might be in a room and everyone just happens to stop talking at the same time. It doesn't happen often, but I've pretty sure everyone's experienced it at least once in their life. This happened when I was in the Grineshwa Jotaling, which as I mentioned, it's only, it's less than a kilometre from the Kailasa temple. I suspect they are both connected via water channels, underground water channels. But when I was in that Mandir, that moment where everything went quiet, my ears adjusted almost immediately to what was happening below the temple itself. And I could hear mechanisms actual mechanisms turning over, almost imagining like, almost imagining cogs turning and connecting into one another. I could hear that, but I could also hear the sound of water running. So there's some sort of technology in these ancient, these super ancient temple sites. Now, unfortunately, a lot of them did get destroyed by the Mughal Empire, um, but it's just something to bear in mind that I, I, I believe that, as you had said, and I believe this wholeheartedly, that India, part of, is a hotbed for a lot of this ancient knowledge that is being left by these builders, for sure, without a doubt in my 100%, mind. 100%. No, and when it's, when it's you've done sad. Study, when you've done study on India's temples at all, I mean, at all, you only need to spend six months on it, six weeks on it, yeah. six hours on it just to have a look. By the time you've started trying to open doors, you'll find yourself 10 years into your research and you're still kind of clutching at straws a little bit. And I mean that on the nicest respect of, as I've said, you know, obviously you've got lovely family in India like I have here. And it, it's such a, for, for ancient history, I've found it such a humble place for, like you, you call yourself a Gora, which makes me laugh, but it's kind of like, um, we're we're kind of outsiders, but I I've never felt like that around Indian families that I know. Nice. It's almost like honestly, mate, they, they they can't bend over backwards enough to welcome you in and what foods they have and just like honestly, I love Indian food more than you can ever imagine. So of course, having Indian family for me is like kind of one of the best things known to man. So. Yeah, so it, it, it is like that too. I go there and I give my best mate's mum a kiss and I'm like, what are we cooking today? Because she's always got a vat of something. And she'll go, go away, Ronnie, because my nickname's Ronnie. Go away, Ronnie. She does. Anyway, but, you know, the humble kind of, um, I, well, I, I dare say we've started to become as experienced as some of the researchers in India that I've ever met because we study it all the time. It's kind of like you and I are uh, we're, we're on a level with we're we're, we're really arrowheading into somewhere special, some, something special 
uh, in India and the research within India, which to me actually has started to ignite my enthusiasm because it's one thing writing papers and studying things and going and getting boots on the ground, but the archaeoacoustic study for me, when we started doing it in January and applying it to different sites, it was like a penny dropped. And then when I added that into the equation of India, it was like, oh my God. And then when you started saying, I can actually let you know about these aquifers and the hydrology and what's going on, I was like, let me know as soon as you can possibly give me any info. This could like change everything. And it, and it has changed. Every, this was the conversation I've been waiting for for months. And like, I'm chuffed. It's got like I think we've actually broken down some really good boundaries today, and, and um, I think we'd be able to get some sufficient testing done to prove what we're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm really chuffed with that. It like makes me smile internally as a researcher to know that because boots on ground work is the only place you're getting things done. It, it, it's irrelevant of what people think until you've got the results. When you've got the results then you can talk about it because you can make conclusions of results not summarizations you know so i want to go and get those results I, I i would be up for uh planning a planning a trip with you when i can humanly do it yeah well look uh, by the I time really by the time that, that i really mean that by the time that you're ready schedules and things like that then <laughs> i want to uh, what do you, is that what you do? Are you able to, if I'm like, right, I've got these time scales in, are you able to do a fortnight here or whatever? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Generally mean, speaking, generally speaking, I can work something out. I mean, obviously, you know, I've got my own, I've got my own hustle, but what I would really love to do in the future, uh, in the, whether in the near or far future is irrespective in the future is actually do something similar to what like you know the blokes in egypt do and i'm obviously talking about egyptian people i'm talking about you know people like brian forrester and like you know um star odyssey and all those other guys that set up these you know these group these group excursions you know like you pay x amount and that person becomes the host and sets everything up sets up the travel sets up the accommodation takes you out to the site shows you everything i would love to do that you know that's in the future on some mass scale though, because Honestly, man, I think the world. That's what we as an institute do. It's what I do. It's what Rick does. We all meet up as much as we can via a team. I've lost your internet again, Foss. Was he with me? Was he? Come back to me. There he is. I'm again. It happened again. Can you hear me? It did happen again. I've got you again. I've got you again. No, what I was going to say was, um, we go we go away as a group, like uh, as much as we can. Um, this year, actually, it's fell on its face because I can't I can't go away at the end of this month. I haven't got my passport touring, but small things and i'll get it dealt with as you have to do you know what i mean it just fucking ran out so i'm just gonna get it sorted and then i'll be ready to go away again I'm, I'm gonna say like Foz, in, in brutal honesty we're probably gonna look at next year and like i would probably do like where i'd plan it with you properly and say right i'm gonna come for a fortnight here Let's go and fucking nail it. whatever we can. And, mate, I'm happy with backpacks on and let's go and fucking kill it, mate. I live in an old, I'm a Marine, mate. I'm a Naval Marine, so it doesn't bother me in the slightest, actually. I, in fact, I love. That's what makes me tick. I kind of, I want to go with somebody on site that wants to get dirty and get in the holes and do the work. I'm not really this whole, like, oh, this is pretty, let's take if it's hallmarks, <laughs> yeah, I'm taking all the fucking hallmarks and I'm taking everything I need. Bam, 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 bam video, video. But I'm doing it all. It's worth it, it. I love my job. I love my work. I go to these sites and I want to take it to pieces and I go with a plan. And whatever you've got to do, 
on that site, get it done, and then enjoy it in it. You know what I mean? But I want the data, mate. I want the data. I want the mineralogy. Yeah. Yeah. I want the samples. I want. I want us to be able to kind of come out of when I get to you because I know we're both capable of this, and I have so many results and so many like wow moments because two weeks is a lot a lot of exploration we can do together real good amount of results yeah i get it we've got to live we've got to sort our shit out so what i would rather do is save properly get my flights done and then save an amount of money that we really can do what I don't, look i don't look to spend loads of money when i'm away at all but i'm gonna need money so uh, it, it is what it is but i don't know what it is to track well, can, back and stuff like you that, can though. have you can have a really easy time getting around in India on not a lot of money. Yeah. Like there's a lot that's quite cheap here comparative. Yes. Okay. There's exchange rates and whatnot, but like British pound is quite strong, right? Naturally it's quite a strong currency. Like I don't know what a hundred British pounds is in Indian rupee, but it yields quite a lot. So, and obviously, in a, like one Australian dollar is equate to about 50 rupees to 55 rupees, give or take. You say and what? One Australian say if dollar. you wanted to go and do a three day excursion, you wanted to be able to eat and drink water, whatever, smoke a couple of fags, just live standard, camp, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like 250 quid a week would be okay to like sort of fucking. Easy. Dude, <clears throat> like my rental property like that I live in right now, this is 250 Australian like per month. And it's like oh, a two bedroom, right. clean running water, everything. It costs nothing, bro. Like that's, that's the equivalent of maybe like 150 pounds, yeah. 160 pounds, somewhere yeah. there. Yeah. So like you can, and, and, and what I'm basically saying is like, yes, like do two weeks, like two weeks traveling, the most you'll spend is probably on accommodation and and food and even on the food you don't even need to go outlandish like there's food stalls everywhere and there's this big misconception unfortunately i know we're going to deviate off the archaeology and deviate into some more cultural things right now but yeah, yeah, there's obviously yeah. this big this big idea of like oh you know there's all this street food and you know you don't want to have the street food because it'll get you sick and blah 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 honestly the vast the vast majority of, of of street vendors that provide something whether that's samosas or whether that's juice or whatever food everything's food. everything dude everything is really clean and even to the cleanliness the vast majority of places and i'm talking like within 99 percentile of the places that i've been to are ridiculously clean because the government of India now, the BJP, the party that Modi, Narendra Modi sits on top of, that party, when they came into power, they introduced what is called a UPI, which is a digital sort of system. So it connects your bank account I to really, multiple yeah. platforms. They're doing a big city dude, out of it. Have you seen the plans? They're doing like dude, a big they're, like they're doing, technological They're doing that everywhere. Yeah, yeah, they're doing that in my city, bro. Like in Ahmedabad, just outside, they're building this. If you haven't got the money, when you get to the doors and your car goes, eh, eh, you can't go shopping, you can't go into that utopia, you can't rent a flat, you can't do fuck all, you're out. Yeah, they're they're they're, they're already across India. There's already smart cities, but with that sort of stuff, what you imagine with like China, that hasn't come into that hasn't come into play yet. But that whole idea of smart cities and, and 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 sort of QR systems and stuff that came in, the beauty of what that did is it allowed pretty much anyone who's poor in the country to access a platform where they can sell their goods, whether that's whether that's something for material, could be a sculpture that someone puts in their house, or whether that's food. So naturally, a lot of the poorer communities across India they just started making food across the board. And obviously when you're on things like Uber Eats, what they have is Swiggy here and Zomato, which are two other major applications. There's Blinkit and a whole other section of them. But the major ones, Swiggy, Uber Eats and Zomato, you don't have a successful business unless your food's clean, unless your hygiene's clean, etc. So naturally, if you want to excel in this country, 
you need to be able to provide a good product. The same idea doesn't differentiate. It's not a racial biases that goes across the board. Everyone, <clears throat> everyone that wants to eat out at any. Well, I know it's place not rationalised out from job families all the way up to the. I, it's not like that. Yeah. Anymore. <laughs> no, no, and it's, it's most of the that, places are clean. What it Correct. is is that they're yeah. not actually racist to a specific genre of Indian. They're racist to the non-rich. You're going to have to have money. And look, I'll be honest with you. This is how I know India, and I love it. I love it. I love it. I've got. I've got. I just digress to my own. I've got a marine friend who's married to an Indian girl. He does a huge YouTube channel. What his YouTube channel is, he looks at the army, the RAF, and the navy, and how India like, and they've got this is a Himalayan part of they're called Nin, Ninja Commandos, and you can see training videos of them. And this one woman, right, Indian woman, she's like she was an Olympian ice wall climber, and what she does with her team is they protect the ice walls of the Himalayas to stop anyone coming over into India. And they do a training video where she's on the side of this fucking mountain with her team going, if you think you're good, at, like basically an Indian, but if you think you're good enough to join my team, this is where you need to be. And she's looking down at her teammates all putting their thumbs up like that. And like I was like, if you watch the actual um, Ninja Commandos, when they do their training, they do this like, Fucking hell, bro. Like on his channel, they do this. It's how you would, like, I, I work as a CPO, so we have what's called principles. So say you are my principal. What it means is basically you do what you're told with me in an I'm protecting your life way and I will protect your life. So I'm your, my job is to be your bulletproof vest. But with that, my team that I work with, looks after your wife your missus she basically would be surrounded in huge blokes and nobody could go near her unless i fucking said brief do you know what i mean so that's kind of how it works do you get do you get my point bro and like i think i think out there indian women now have got to a level where they are so educated that you are not going to just get an indian woman but to cook and clean in your fucking house like it was 25 years ago as an indian bloke so indian blokes haven't got the luxury of choosing indian women like that any fucking more you know <laughs> indian yeah. women are very, so very fucking fun. educated people you know you'll actually find you'll actually find there's a massive there's a huge degree of separation with English speakers and their sex in India. You'll actually find the vast majority of women sort of from the ages of 35 and under now speak English, like secondary, tend to speak its secondary language, um, where guys is actually sort of behind in that lit in the English literacy, like literacy sort of race. There's some reasons why um, single women in India they get a lot of benefits um, through the government. Like there's a lot of schemes and stuff for improving education with women and stuff like that. So a lot of women tend to go and do multiple education curriculums. So English, obviously part of that where men get a cutoff period. I think it's like by 25 and by 25, it doesn't matter if you're single or not, like you stop receiving any sort of benefits around the ed around like educating yourself where women keep getting it as long as they're single, like until they marry essentially. Um, but like irrespective, bro, like the cultures changed dramatically, man. Like I was shocked when I got here. Like there was so much, there was so many misconceptions like right off the bat that like I had told to me before getting to India. And bro, you mentioned about like the, like the humble hospitality of, you know, your family friends. That's no different here, bro. Like they've got a term, I, I'd, I'd butcher it if I tried to even attempt it in Sanskrit, but in English it translates to guest is God. So a guest coming to either your home, your abode, or even coming into your country is God. And it's not mean in the sense that, that guest is God. It means like they are God. It means in the sense that, like you treat your guests like you would treat your divinity, like you would treat your deity. You should treat them with respect. I feel that I yeah. get 
treated around and if I'd like to check it out like like the parents are getting elderly around my best mate now since I've been little every single time I see her I'll go in the kitchen give her a kiss how are you darling you okay give her a bit of a cuddle and she'll sort of like I know you only want food Ronnie this was when I was little do you know what I mean and then like since I've got older and she's got older they all live in the same house still and then her mum only died last year. She was 101, mate. Like, it's like they just fucking live forever, Indian people. But anyway, um, if it, what I found is show respect and you get a lot of respect back when it comes to Indian people. And with me, that goes a long way from how I've been brought up. So I show ultimate respect love honor trust and i've had nothing but that back and i've got to be honest it's one of the reasons i thought well especially with how vast uh and how much there is to talk about within indian architecture in history because it's obviously my passion but the subject became that vast it's not just an indus valley river it's an absolute ocean pacific atlantic it's a vast running machine of like like when you start asking yourself questions you can turn yourself a little bit mad because seriously there's like a line of temples that goes from tamil nadu to the himalayas and it's probably about i don't know i think is it a thousand kilometers and up it there's something like on a line of like as if they were showing you this is where you need to go and this is like there was an original kind of mapping system to how it all worked. I, I know that's a bit Game of Thrones-esque, but it's almost like they're not trying to hide it from you. It's like everyone else tries to make it look hard. It, it's almost like they built those temples to show you that something was going on, Himalaya style. And look now, India actually vigilantly defend the Himalayas to the backbone. And it is nothing but ice and nastiness to get over. But yeah, it bridges the gap over, well, let's just say the Silk Road to fucking China, doesn't it, at the end of the day? So it's like, just crazy, man. It's 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 nuts, dude. Like I, I haven't obviously been to the Himalayas yet, but I can't wait to go and see it, man. And like one of the things that, you know, I get sort of, grabs me more than anything when you go to these sites is just the sheer magnitude of them. It's just the sheer just the sheer volume of the temple complexes. And that's not on every site, because you'll go around India, bro. You'll tend to find, you know, like if you go around India, you'll naturally find like, you know, sort of temples all over the place. They're everywhere, little ones, modern ones, etc. But when you go to the ancient, the ancient temples, the ancient sites, like the proper ones that are, you know, supposedly dated during the, the period of Asoka, those just leave you absolutely bewildered, not just from the sheer magnitude of how big they are, but also pretty much everything that we've described over the last like three hours it makes me smile about it it really does it, i can't wait i can't wait to show you bro i truly man like and anyone else do like if ricardo or anyone else wants to come bro, i try and get all get of ourselves us, i think to be honest we'll get a travel bus bro we'll get a travel bus automatic because i can't drive manual otherwise someone has to get their international permit and use the manual but like you go to these places man like it will change your perception on so many different levels not just from the physical space that you see but also like the ethereal also the spiritual bro like there's a lot that can be said about a place but the, it nothing of what anyone can say will do do anything justice until you actually go to these places themselves because when you get to these sites and it's not the people that are there. And as I said, it's not just the sheer monumental size of these. These sites have an energy that permeates outwards. These have a natural resonance to them. They've got some sort of, as we discussed, acoustic properties, what have you. But there's, a, there's an energy that permeates out of these sites. Now, I don't know if it's to do with just the water. I don't know if it's to, just to do with the acoustics. I don't know if it's to do with the piezoelectricity. I don't know if it's to do magnetic alignment of these sites or maybe it's a culmination of everything together 
or whatever the case may be, you go to these sites, bro, you walk into some of these temple rooms, dude, your whole being shifts. Just the vibrational effect of these rooms, bro, literally shift something inside you and you just go, whoa. Yeah. And yeah, man, it's it's been an absolute the blessing to be here, bro, and I can't yeah, wait. The streams are still functional to me. It just says functional. Quote, unquote, yeah. functional. Simple as that. And I reckon you can manipulate, like I've said to you earlier on, I reckon you can manipulate that feeling by adjusting the frequency in that room. I promise you, I think that is exactly what we will be able to do. And I'm going to fucking test it, bruv. I, I honestly I think, wait, something, I think we're right on it. I really do. Uh, feels I like it. To me, I don't feel like I'm clutching at straws. It feels like... The evidence is there. You could run the frequencies and we can tell whether we're right or wrong because that feeling will enhance or decrease. It's as simple as that. Simple as that, mate. Dude, dude, ascetic monks, ascetic monks, like Buddhist ascetic monks, they still go to these sites. Till this, It's not something that like, oh, the monks used it and then they stopped using it. Dude, a lot of these sites, like some of the ones that I went to, there's still monks that go to these sites and they're allowed to stay overnight. Like they're allowed to stay as long as they want. They don't pay nothing. Like they don't pay a fee to enter nothing. They literally walk in. They'll go into a room, bro, and like you'll walk past the room and they're just in there just in a, some sort of transcendental frigging state. And these they monks are still using these. About. They know what they're looking for. They know that there's obviously been a deep study in different cultures. And when you're looking at Tibetan monks and things like that, they've looked at this kind of thing, Shaolin's, whatever, for thousands of years, you know, like through their yep. historic history. You've even got to put Japan, China, India, all of them in that, you know. This has been something that has been dramatically studied, mate. And like at the top levels is going to have been hidden just like everything else i just think we're kind of scratching the surface of something that's really fucking powerful fast uh, i'm not joking yeah i do I think... I, i'm you're not going to feel me you're not going to have a disagreement from me dude and unfortunately i think the biggest problem is there is a lack of historical record and any surviving records that happen to exist I think they're locked away, not just obviously within the Vatican they're archives. Locked away, mate. Or, or well, we we're not privy to it as the public. Do you know what I mean? It's well, a lot of these. If you go into the north, into the Himalayas and the foothills of the Himalayas, there tends to be a lot of these monasteries. Yeah, and one of these monasteries is noted in a bunch of historical records. It's called the Hemis Monastery. Um, and it's in Tibet, I believe, but it's like uh, originally it? where it is. Sorry. It, is in, Sorry. it is in Tibet, mate. Yeah. yeah. And there's there's many of these there's many of these monasteries that have tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of documents that have never been deciphered, never been like taken. And they tend to all, from my understanding, is most of them have been written in like some form of Sanskrit, some form of Tamil as well, that happen to like rest in these like sort of ancient sites and, I, and sorry, ancient monasteries. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if documentation was sent because bear in mind, like a lot of the sites across India that happen to come under like the the um, inquisition of mogul rule and mogul dominance yeah. for sure for sure some of these sites would have their knowledge taken in some sort of written form like you can look at like nalanda university as an example and the, i wouldn't be surprised if some of those transcribes or those 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 scribing scrawlings written documentation what have you happen to be moved to other places to to safeguard them whether that happens to be in the Vatican archive, which should be made public as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, any sort of ancient text that exists in the Vatican archive that is from India or any other country should actually be handed back over to their respective nations to be deciphered and used for goodwill purposes. Absolutely, 100%. I think it's criminal yeah. that the Indian people 100%. don't have all of the Vedic texts that are held there, I think it's criminal. Sorry, I do. I just, I, and, it's, and, and like you just rightly said, any other nation that has got any kind of sec secret knowledge that we may need to know, I just think it's criminal, mate. I do. 
Oh, no, no one person it. holds the right to that information. No. no way. Well, this is this is this is I guess the big. This is actually a massive degree. The, the degree of separation is massive in this particular thing when it comes to this idea of knowledge. So, like obviously in the West, like money is power, right? Yeah. In the yeah. East, in the East, and that extends to the subcontinent of India. That's, I mean, I don't know too much about China nowadays, maybe once upon a time that wasn't the case, but if we look at India as a sort of like idea of this thought in India, knowledge is more powerful than money in, in every single aspect. Like, dude, even the poorest people here, like don't even really care that much for money. It, it's not something that tends to drive them. Like, you know, you'll see like in Britain, in London, or in Melbourne, or in Sydney, or in Toronto, or any other Western major city across you know the Western, the West countries, you'll go to a, you'll go to one of these major cities, and you'll see, you'll see what you'll see homeless people, as opposed to, you know, you got to get flood. Oh, got you back, got you back, ish. Got me back. Yeah. So, like, the one thing that you'll see, and this was a bit of a shocker to me, to be completely honest with you, is in the West you'll see homeless people, right? You don't, but you'll see homeless individuals. In India, you don't see that. You actually see homeless couples. You know, you'll see a family, even despite all financial disparity. They'll like stay together. They'll have kids. Any money that they manage to acquire, they'll just put towards like small portions of food, rice, meat, like wheat, stuff like that, and actually make things out of it and feed their family. It's so like the husband and wife are together, irrespective of the fact that they're homeless. Like that's a massive difference that you see as opposed to the West. When you think of a homeless person in like London or in Melbourne, you tend to think that like, well, they're likely a drug addict, right? They've likely done something bad to get into a position like that. In India, it's not so much the case. Some people are actually quite happy to be poor. Like they actually don't, and it's not with everyone, of course, but there tends to be this big differential between like money causing peace and prosperity as opposed to like knowledge and the spirit creating peace and prosperity within oneself or within one's family. So that's that's another massive cultural difference that I've noticed here, being here. But what a, what a lovely still one man. to have and what a lovely one to notice. I mean, quite a sad story yeah, but yeah, with such a nice moral. And it, 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 sit, it sits well with me for one reason that, like, this goes for any Westerner, or Eastern or wherever you may come from, you know, you you can't take with you what you've got. And I do agree that it's the journey, the people you meet along the way that really make, like I, I always saw in the beginning, you know, like oh, I will get to the, the secrets, the secrets will come to me. The, the God, the God I, I was put here for a reason, I haven't survived war and accidents and my bowel pulled out and this and that wanting to die and i'm here for a reason what is it and like i always thought that like those jigsaw piece puzzles would come through all the hours of reading the traveling the picking up the crystals taking the mineralogy sample seeing the site the pleasure i get is in the journey, the training every day to do the expeditions. I love my training, you know, the meeting people, the the learning about different cultures and how they work. Not only that, right now, put that into context, to speaking to an Australian in India and you're speaking to an Englishman that travels to Portugal and then that opens a lot of doors to like multiple, like already multiple avenues of conversation within the institute that has american and this and that and then one day when we're all together we put our ideas down it's not just my jigsaw piece that gets put down anymore it's like four five six seven eight nine ten eleven and you start seeing a bit more of a picture than you ever thought possible and 
like um, I will actually big up today. I like really wanted to do this interview myself, and um, obviously me and you've got on for quite a while, and like we've got very similar passions. It's unfortunate that the lads couldn't have been here, but I'm really, really lucky to have had this interview myself. I wanted that. And, um, like, honestly, when it all kind of fell apart a little bit last night, I was like, no way. And then Rick was like, yeah, I've got it all sorted. I was like, buzzing. So I was out, I was. I was watching the England game. I was getting hammered. I was like, no, 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 no. I've got my day planned tomorrow for this. I'm, like, really looking forward to it. I've gone out for dinner, I've gone and done my things today, and I was like, I have got to be at my house at this time. This is what's happening. I'm really looking forward to it because I thought the... Because you're forthright with your findings of boots on ground, which is great to me. Well, to the knowledge of one way, you know what I mean? Like, what, what, what did you see? What was there? What was that? What, that and, like, I think we've opened some doors today, Fozzie. I'm... Uh, I'm really chuffed, mate. Really chuffed with this. I think um I think you should work really closely with I don't think we should just podcast, mate. I think we should uh, you should work with me really closely and we should get some areas of testing that you think would be viable that we could get access to and we can plan a real good trip around that. I'll bring what equipment I've got. If we've got a longevity of time, so we plan it for sort of like, you know, like a, a, a May, June, whatever, whenever it might be next year. If we know a schematic and what equipment we might need, we can have all that in place. I can book some tickets, we can get it paid off, and I can get my ass to you. And we can, uh, to me, that sounds, well, I like planning, I do. I like to where I don't want to just turn up having a bit of a laugh and a joke. I get it, we could do that and we would get testing done, but. Like I said to you, over two weeks, we're going to have one day where we're a Roy 5, have a few, which we probably will every day. But um, I want to get some work done. I know you're that guy. I know that you don't mind trekking. I know you don't mind boots on ground, which is fantastic for me because we can find the rooms that no one else will. We can test for things that other people won't. We can look in the areas that others won't. And if there's a hole to get in, I'm getting in it and I'm gone. I'm going and jumping in there, you know, and you know I'm that guy as well. But I also know that you'll come down, as well, like, you know, so I think that's a, a good proposition. We can be clever. And what I'd like to do as well, I mean, it depends on how much of a hiker and how much of uh, an enthusiast she is to do it in the testing. Bring your wife as long as well. And uh, if we can get rich. Oh, she loves it, bro. Yeah, she we can get rid of it. She get loves taking it. the camera, taking photos and shit. She she loves all that. She'd so be able to me. do, in fairness, is if we need to do because we could do um live videos from where we are off both our channels, you know. Uh we could do it through the institute, your channel, wherever the hell we want to do it. If she videos it, we can show mineralogies, we can show sampling. We can show everything live to where we are, you know. We can even, yeah, like, yeah, have a separate yeah. sound system and say, this is what we're doing right now. Enter. Mm, and I get it. I get what you mean. We need quiet conditions for this. We, we need to go to temples that are quiet where we can run specific infrasound testing, you know. We can turn it up that's when we go out. With the night trekking. Yeah, we, that's what we need, mate. But it's yeah. very easy to do as well. Like when I say night trekking, like the terrain's not difficult terrain. It's really not challenging terrain. If you have a little bit of light, like you can get through the terrain then pretty easily. And a lot of these sites, as I said, they've got very rudimentary security. So like at Arangabad and Sambaji Nagar, that um that site that's sort of like the 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 staging ground for you to go to Alora and Ajanta. <clears throat> At like the Orangabad caves and stuff, their security that's set up is simply this 
rudimentary scaffolding that's been put up and you just like walk through the scaffolding, go up to a box, pay the guy, and then he gives you a ticket and then you just go in. So it's very, very rudimentary. There's only anywhere from between like one to two security guards that sort of like operate the sites at any given time. And they just go around to make sure you're not destroying anything or defacing anything. That's mainly it. They don't, they don't really bother you. Yeah, some of them are in the woods sites. waiting for you and no Correct. call. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I yeah, yeah. If they and actually so, caught you there, they wouldn't be that bothered. But look, the only thing that tends to happen, the only thing that tends to happen is at some of the sites that I've been to, is the security guards insist insist on giving you a tour, and you have to pay them for the tour. But ah. it's generally like, it's generally like. You know, when I've done it, it's been like anywhere from between 300 rupees to 400 rupees, which is nothing, right? But what that did for me is it allowed me to get access into areas that the general public wasn't getting access into. So they'd have like literally like bars and ropes, or sorry, not bars, they'll have like ropes set up or like movable, um, you know, like restricting fences made out of wood and stuff like that, like barricades essentially put up to stop you from getting into different sections of the site but like you know the security guard knows you're there you've got the camera they saw me with the gopro they're like oh you know like we can show this guy some extra stuff and he's just got to pay us like a little bit of money doesn't bother me bro 400 rupees and you showed me a section that 99 percent of the public don't get to see but doesn't bother me happy bro, any day of the week. days bro happy, 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 happy. Go. Let's get in there and fucking tough. yeah so dude, most, of, most of the people like, are really chill like the, bulk, the bulk of the money that i would bring and i guess you'd do this anywhere you go right you want to survive yourself eat camp do what you do right i, I smoke weed i do i don't give a shit and I'll find weed, fucking beer, wherever I go. So it is what it's it is. It's all over India. <laughs> it is what it is, mate. So, like, I have this, like, thing around me where people are going, oh, you're right, mate. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I get on with everybody, mate. Like, I'm covered in tattoos. I very rarely wear a top. And people go, oh, look at you. And I'm like, I get, like, a handshake. I always give cuddles. And everyone thinks I'm, like, some sort of big teddy bear because I'm quite a big lad under my top, like, do you know what I mean? And uh, I get that whole, like, mate, real nice vibe with everybody. That I've, Everybody that I've gone abroad to meet anywhere, whether it be Portugal or Spain, and I've got what I consider family in these areas now, like Portugal, Spain, Germany, Zurich, Switzerland um australia i mean come on do you know what i mean like i've got indian friends mm -hmm. you're now in india which makes it even fucking bad like to me like the networking system now with like what i actually want is where likewise you and your your missus are welcome to come this end because i've got a couple of houses where i am as well i live in a pretty massive northwest corner of a stately home but i've got another house up the road as well but it is what it is but my point being, if we, everyone was doing an expedition to the UK, get everyone over here and we do everything from mine. And, like, I love having that kind of, like, oh, wicked, let's get this done and let's get over there and whack a backpack. Because I, obviously I'm not going to be lying on your set here getting pissed watching the fucking TV. I couldn't give a fuck about that, bollocks. I just want to have a shower and let's get out and fucking what we're doing. I I so fucking research it. That Dude, you, you will love it, man. You truly yeah, will love it, bro. Yeah, and yeah. you know, most of the most of the people that I've interacted with. Keep talking, with, bro, because I, I need a piss again. Yeah, all good, mate. One of the things that I noticed almost immediately um is how hospitable people are. Um, you know, even if you don't speak Hindi, it's sort of and Hindi's not the national dialect, there's not really a nationalized language. I think there's like 27 languages in India. But most people can speak Hindi sort of as a secondary language um, <clears throat> in some places as a first language. But even if you don't speak English, like I've had experiences where people will just go out of their way to find someone that speaks English, even if it's like rudimentary English, and be able to help you with whatever it is that you need help with, whether that's trying to get directions or trying to understand something or simply yeah. as ordering a meal, you know, yeah. like it's 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 been it's been a blessing just from that standpoint mm. and then 
there's this yeah dude and then there's been like the secondary aspect of like the hospitality of everything you know like it doesn't matter where you go there's this one there's this thing that's constantly there and I guess Westerners don't Westerners that haven't really been to other countries where Western people don't dominate. Yeah. You know, it's it's quite an interesting experience to have because some of these sites that I've been to, especially some of these temples, some of these monumental temples that are like literally built into mountains separate from the caves that I've mentioned, that are, you know, highly revered in Hinduism, like, you know, and millions of devotees, millions of worshippers flock to these places year after year. And you go to some of these places where no Westerners go. All you have is thousands of pairs of eyes just locked on you at any given moment. And whilst that might be intimidating at, at first thought, it really humbles you, bro. It really makes you just like, um, it, me it really makes you sort of a lot more self-aware of your place in the world. I like think everyone that in the West has got so used to that. Centering your kind of aura into that environment. So then you will feel comfortable because Indian people only ever want you to feel comfortable, although that may be intimidating. It's down to you and your aura to feel okay about where you are, which is what they're aiming to do. I felt nothing but comfortability around uh, any of the Indian families. Actually, I've met fucking hundreds in my time now, and like I've literally had that um, feeling of family through them all. Like every single one of them, like it would welcome you in for food and all. I mean, you can go to a church here, an Indian church, a Hindu church, a Sikh church. Sorry, uh, all of them do this. I don't know whether you know this happens in in England or whether this happens in... I, I might be a bit naive, but it might happen in all Sikh temples. I don't know. But here in England, where we are, or where I would definitely around where we live, and you don't even need to be Sikh or anything like that. You can go to a Sikh temple whenever you want. You can go there whenever you want. And Sikh temples put on this loads of food, like curries and this and that for the people that go there to worship but as homeless people in the uk or somebody that's on the streets or anybody that just wants to go there because they can't get food i mean it mate it makes me cry it does at times because we have a real problem with it but they will feed the homeless anybody that goes there it's like they, they're so selfless and lovely and just a, a magical set of people, in my opinion. Just magical. Oh, magical. No, magical. yeah. All, all the... So the term is is Gudwara, like the Sikh temple, the Gudwara. Yeah. And oh, the, yeah. the same the same is across globally. That's like one of the core tenets of being Sikh. So that idea of guest is God, that's amplified in Sikhism, especially in like the waters and stuff like that. So yeah, they'll let anyone in. doesn't matter if they're generally speaking. And obviously there's, you know, like anything you're going to find. Again, there's stuff. lines you don't cross there, right? I get that. Correct. I'm correct. not going to go that right now. We don't. Neither do am I. Neither am I. Neither am I. But generally speaking, like it doesn't matter whether you're a Sikh, a Buddhist, uh, a Hindu, a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew. It doesn't matter what your Indian. religious background is. As if you go to a Sikh Gurdwara, right, they will let you into the Gurdwara. They will let you participate and they will feed you. That's like a sort of core principle, a core tenet of like so yeah, Sikhs yeah. outlay in the community. You find it's very similar in Hinduism as well, albeit depending on where you go, I, it's probably more prevalent in, in the diaspora as opposed to being in India because obviously India has essentially been under some form of occupation, you know, for roughly around 13, 1400 years, give or take. Okay, so like there's still a lot of like generational sort of trauma that's laid into specific cultural groups that exist across India because there's like 27 different languages. There's a bunch of different like Indians aren't just like one shade of brown. Like there's all there's so many different types of Indians. It doesn't matter if it's Gujaratis or Gujaratis in Gujarat or 
Kannadas in Karnataka or, or, you know, Keralites in Kerala, like everyone's a little bit different in some respect. The sort of philosophical, spiritual aspects are the same, but how those cultures behave with foreigners, it definitely, it's definitely different depending on the place. But if you go there with a whole, and this is just from my personal experience, if you go there with a whole heart and actually show reverence to the site, so whether that's participating in a puja, which is just a very simple, like rudimentary sort of, I mean, there's a deeper layer to it from 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 a Hindu standpoint, but to the outsider, to a foreigner, it's simply just a a very simple, um, you know, like a like a like a very simple offering, a very simple sort of, um, you know, how would you describe it? It's 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 almost like. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? My God, it begets me now because we've been going on for so many hours. Uh, <laughs> not, worship, not worship. It's um, a ritual. Ritual is the word I was looking for. Sorry. So, like, it's just a very basic ritual. Stuff like that, you know, if you go and worship, like, you know, one of the deities that's there, even if you don't follow Hinduism to its, like, 10th degree, like, even if you just have, like, a rudimentary belief in, like, karma, karma, for example, right, and, like, you just go to these sites just as a, just as a form of reverence for being in the area. Dude, even the Hindus will just welcome we win with open arms. Like they they tend to fare better with obviously people that are a bit more open-minded. Pagans, as you mentioned, like you're pagan. I consider myself pagan as well. So it's very easy to sort of like blend in with that culture in some form or another and sort of understand the more nuanced approach of why these worships worshipings are happening why these rituals are happening and stuff like that but yeah man like the entire community doesn't matter if it's hindu sikh buddhist jain they're all very welcoming with open arms like i said guest yeah. is god like that's a core tenet of india that's a core tenet of bharat that that core tenet doesn't doesn't differentiate across the religious groups in India. I think that's any like time, I think any time in general from anybody that i've ever met in the region or lives there like yourself and your lovely family and whatever i've never had anything other than you've got to come and you've got to come and see it now and it's like amazing now let's go let's go let's go it's almost like a, what you're waiting for we'll give you everything you need let's go and like i kind of have had that pull for india for, for 10 years but let's say heavily for five years and like i wanted to do that set of temples going up to the himalayas but it i think they do an actual excursion tour that does it right there's a few of them that do it bro they do like full yeah. pilgrimage tours they'll take you around to like a hundred different sites over like the course of like two three weeks like yeah. you have to pay something obviously they'll yeah, like we could just follow that accommodation. one of the times on that. i'm really Dude, honestly you know what's you, you know it's probably easier bro like you just hire a, you just hire like they're called they refer to here as just traveler buses so they're like a bus but a much smaller one they're maybe like 16 to 18 seats and some of them are like retrofitted to have like maybe eight seats and then a section where like people can set up their equipment and stuff like that, like storage essentially. And they're all over the place, dude. Like oh, these yeah. travel, like these travel companies are oh, everywhere, bro. Perfect. They're everywhere, man. And they're cheap as dude. Like you rent one of these buses for like a couple of weeks, it might cost you like five hundred pounds, bro. Like it's nothing, man. Like that's it seriously is nothing. That's what we want is basically yeah, dude. able to travel easily and have equipment and that would be perfect so we'd budget that in what we need to do across our holiday you know and um, it oh, I, think it'd be, I think it'd be really good i mean what i'd like to do mate is obviously the KLS one. i know i'd probably get boring for you but i do want to do that with my own eyes and test there there's like so many rooms to find there's like nine hidden rooms i know praveen's found one i found a really good one on the northern side which is a cave hole that goes in on the top northern side and i reckon it actually fuck knows where it goes to bro but I see on one photo that they had an electrical line that was attempting to go somewhere near it. And then it goes across and it goes into another hole. It's like they're boring it to see if there's anywhere else to fucking... Now, I think there is. I think there's another entrance at the top that they're missing, which I would love to explore. There is. 
at the Kailasa Temple, <clears throat> there is another entrance. It's blocked off, it's gated off, but that connects down. So there's actually a massive set of stairs. I mentioned it earlier about the bats. So that temple there, that smaller temple, if you open that gate and you can see it, you can walk up to the gate itself and actually look and peer down. There's actually like a set of stairs that goes all the way down into Are this they like, vast they chamber. Like? They're like basalt or granite stairs. No, like but what, I mean, what, what, stairs. what do they look like? Do they look walkable? Yeah, I mean, they yes, they look walkable, but they're not they're not wide steps. They don't have a lot of depth to them. They're like probably no more than maybe like fifteen centimeters to twenty centimeters in depth. So they're like little. Correct. They are. They are. But you can get down there. Like I'm sure you know. And you'd want to go down these steps, wouldn't you? You'd want to harness. Well, you wouldn't go. You wouldn't go. You wouldn't go down these steps during the monsoon season when it's always raining. Obviously, naturally, because that water is going to seep down on those stairs and make them quite slippery. But during the drier months, like during the sort of like summer months, like it might be warm, but like you can definitely go down down those steps without a hitch. But in that chamber that it goes you down, and you can see this northern all can you from them steps then. Yeah, dude, the hole's massive. It's a huge hole that goes all the way down, but that connects, but that hole, dude, that connects down into the aquifer. I'm assuming there's other, I'm assuming there's other chambers and stuff that are connected I'm to that, but when you look you down in that hole. Blocks on a fucking level, going around a balcony, and it's like almost you yep. can look over and see it working. I bet you, I bet you all sorts of money. I, that I, room I wouldn't be surprised. In there, I've Dude, there's heaps of there's heaps messages, mate. Oh, yeah. there's there's heaps of caves there's heaps of cave systems that are all, all of these cave systems that the archaeological survey of India have blocked off, and obviously their reasoning for blocking blocked it off is because possibly blocked them off or just put gates. No, they've just put gates essentially. They've just put gates up, like and just padlocked them to stop people from getting so we'd in there. Getting the fuck over them and roll it right. Yeah, look, some of the sites, and I've looked at some are of the sites that have been locked up. Are they to do this? Some, some are, yeah. Yeah. And I say that because, and, and I only say that purely because, like I mentioned earlier on in the podcast, the tectonic activity that took place in the past has made some of the sites or mm. some sections of the sites unstable. But then in some other sections, there's been like rooms that have been carved out that are incomplete in this like excavation process where the ceilings, the actual rock in the ceilings have begun to become loose because those rooms either sit under or next to connecting underground aquifers. So those ceilings have begun to leak and water seeps through them. So obviously it's made the rock like weak. So rock tends to fall down. And I've heard stories about people like, you know, having essentially big blocks of basalt fall on them. I, I've never read anything about this, but there are areas in some of these sites that are a bit hazardous. But during the drier months, I can't foresee these things being a hazard. They're mainly hazards during the monsoonal sort of seasons when there's very heavy rainfall. Uh, but generally speaking, they tend to be pretty safe, man. Like even the bodies of water that like happen to be accessible, like you're not really going to find like a lot of bad bacterium that are in these sort of like bodies of water, you know, like there's algae, right? I think but that I algae think, is also... I think if you go underneath the surface of the original top layer, I think it would be pure as fuck. You could fucking swim in it, mate. Oh, mo most of the aquifers, most of, most of the aquifers, I would say, I'd be even inclined to say pretty much all of the aquifers that are, sort of covered from the general public due to them literally being natural aquifers and the you know the walls and such. Yeah. They'd, don't they'd, they'd all be pretty oh, yeah. Yeah. they'd all be pretty clean water, dude. They'd yeah, all be yeah. very clean water. Well yeah. I'll go yeah. as far as to say they tested the Osira shaft uh, in Egypt for mm -hmm. water cons. People have swam in it and this that, and the other and the top looks like that algae style crap that you would get. It got it they like on certain periods of more heavy rain, that algae sort of moves away and people wash it away. And people have actually got in it. People have drank it because I just fuck it. I'm in the Osiris shaft water. 
clear as a bell, mate. Clear as a bell. You might be right. You might be right with that. Uh, uh, piezoelectric electrolysis to water, sort of giving some sort of bacterial clearance to the water. It would have had multiple purposes. I get that, that we've been speaking about. But I love that idea. I really do like that idea. And if you were doing it through mountain ranges, that that's a filtration system and a half, let's be honest. It really is. It's kind of taking, let's just run uh, army-style coal uh, socks and uh, seawater through it. Isn't quite the same method, although it's correct. But they're doing it on a enormous scale here of... But 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 how do you pick a mountain, channel it out and design it into temples based on subterranean water levels, engineer that, and then build a cherry on the top that we haven't got a fucking clue how they did it? I mean, where does yeah, that come from? I, I, I just think, like we said earlier, man, I just think that these builders, whoever they are, whether these the builders that are referenced in, you know, different sort of mythology whether that's like you know in sumerian mythology or when that's in greek you know mythology or south america or india or you know anywhere in ancient europe these ideas of you know these beings sort of coming and and gifting whether that's once holding the bags or whatever the case may be this idea that there was beings that sort of came to these areas where humanity began to sort of propagate from let's say and gave them the tools and knowledge of either how to build or gave them the tools and knowledge of maybe husbandry or agriculture whatever the case may be but it's it's interesting that these these sort of vestibules of of cultural expansion these epicenters of cultural expansion tend to be near these these hotbeds of these ridiculously intricate ancient sites that obviously you and me are both in the belief of that are from a different time are from these ancient builders but as i said i don't know who these builders were but whoever they were i suspect they are from a different age of man they are from a time long gone that we've forgotten about but we haven't entirely forgotten about because there's obviously still this drive to understand. There's still these ancient sites that exist across the planet that are showing all these tell telltale mar markings, all these hallmarkings of these ancient tools that were some sort of ancient tools that were used to to carve out these sites, to cut these sites, to understand the hydrological aspects of these sites to understand the acoustic properties of these sites, to even to the degree to understand the ethereal and spiritual aspects of these sites as well. That's not even catering into the understanding of piezoelectricity. That's not even catering into the understanding of how to channel water, how to far find these hydrological sort of aspects in nature. That's not even, that's not even including having the understanding of the magnetic lines and the magnetic currents that are in the planet and and building structures that are magnetically aligned you know and it's 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 it bothers me that it bothers me that mainstream historians in general sort of forgo this idea of trying to pull back the veil on what we truly know about like our ancient ancestors because at the end of the day whether people want to like believe it or not we are you said 375,000 years if that's the case if that's what the records are now even still even if we're only 100,000 years but let's say you know let's say we're 350,000 at a minimum yeah like in some ancient like in some ancient text dharmic hindu text but has been translated or transferred sorry into like jainism and stuff like that we're well and truly over a million years old but if we are 350,000 at a bare minimum, right, and what we've achieved in the last 5,000 years, let alone the last 100 years, and let's say mainstream historians say with, you know, our, our expansion of human, the human consciousness in the physical space is only like 7,000 years old, what the fuck were we doing for the last 343,000 years? 
If we've yeah. managed to build a phone in less than a yeah. hundred years, yeah. where I can contact someone on the other side of the planet, what the fuck were we doing? That bothers me, bro. I can't. I, I, I can't get past that either. I can't get past that either, Foz. You know, it, that just doesn't ring true to me. I don't think it rings true to a lot of people that are really starting to get invested in this. Even if people are only getting invested into this just purely through the idea of viewership and, you know, having sort of rudimentary conversations or just find this subject matter to be really engaging and insightful. I think most people now are under this assumption that, holy shit, we are this old and what have we to show for it? Truly, what do we have to show? It's so false, right? I did a video on, I did a series on it, bro, like, and it concentrates between 45,000 years ago and 32,000 years ago. I write a timeline around it, but it concentrates on, um, and I do about five episodes, well, three episodes on the gravity as part of it. But when you had Neanderthal, Ignatian, Denisov, and you had at least 15, 16, 17 genotypes at that point, but let's talk very, very clever intellects that swapped on the new road to India every 2,000 mm. years. They swapped children and went back to well, the areas, gravity and were masters of the cold, Neanderthal were dying out really over 10,000 years because it, we were going very cold on the planet. Gravity and were experts in Russia, Pavlov, experts. They ran the new, new road Silk Road over the Himalayas through China into India, that part of it through the coal. It's lucky we had them because the Ice Age would have killed off normal ACH humans. We've had a mini ice age as well. Now, any major brains, knowledge, capabilities, it doesn't matter where you hid yourself. You look, what could have come out of it was weirdos that didn't really know what the fuck was going on, although they had knowledge, which would be priceless at that point in time if you think about it. We don't really know that knowledge. Now, I'll, I'm going to say this to you, okay? You would have uh, what your time scales are and what you like to prescribe as time scales. And when Atlantis was around, you would have had Lemuria and Mew. Now, that, alongside New Zealandia and other continents that would have been around as well, so whatever. But New Zealandia was enormous it dwarfed the size of australia you guys like swallow the uk by i think you could fit like i think it's something like 38 35 uk's into australia new zealandia australia was about the same it was fucking enormous like anyway that was with the seas gone but think 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 about those continents when the ices came down if you'd have lived separately around that, and then you had the leaders of like Atlantis, Lemur, no, and then the walls came down like slowly into Mew over another 4,000, 3,000 years. And eventually you had like Samaria born, you had everything born into where we were, and superpowers like button heads like that, that they dominated their area but there was no ice there anymore and i think then if war in factions hit heads you were going to lose again that knowledgeable set of people and i think what's been lost really bro is the knowledge it's the knowledge and what we're drawing on is evidence rather than war because it's easy to follow war in history i do i do it it's what i do um Serious man, it's how I follow war back. I second world war, first war. Welcome to ancient history, and there we go. And I, I fell in love with the Spartan Wars. I did my degree in Roman Roman occupation of kind of Egypt. I liked Mark Anthony Cleopatra, but I didn't stick with that. I I, I ended up more going back Greek and hating um, what I loved about. Rome, when I first loved Rome, in the, then Greece, then 
Egypt, then Rome, then, oh no, what was going on there? And then that trident just went, what we have to look at and when we follow it today as a western world what the greeks put into place we follow right now we've changed nothing from there we follow them stringently as a western world correctly so it's the ancient principles of the greek world are correct but why aren't we encompassing eastern values within that and then you wouldn't be taking hours out of the day you wouldn't be manipulating time everything would be regulated properly like it was in greece and in the east at that point in time the east was probably about 25 30 percent cleverer than everywhere else rome couldn't conquer there they could only hope to do that it was just more of a uh yeah we'll help you out emperor there you go fuck off do you know what i mean and in my studies that's how it is that's how it was and they did as they were fucking told me now they didn't do that anywhere else and the only reason that they showed respect in the east is because mate the east had brains and they were they called china magical they couldn't go there because they were magical and they didn't want to go to that place where these dark non-humans lived what does that fucking mean? It's because China had fire, bombs, weapons, probably beyond your wildest dreams at that point in time. And the Romans were scared shitless of going anywhere near them. So what was going on in India, China, in Malaya at that point when everybody, if you Game of Thrones it, they were the kingdom, weren't they, really? Like, fucking who got near them? No one. No one, no one wanted to go near them. Not even the superpowers wanted to go near them. So then all of a sudden the Mongol army came around and fucking, yeah, all right. Genghis Khan was a little well, bit the, stuff with the world and fucking ransacked everything. But what well, he, even even Genghis didn't even even Genghis Khan himself and, and his hordes, they never attacked India. Yes, his his lineage down the line came in to like the subcontinent, like through the sort of that Gangetic plain. So like that region of Northern Pakistan and stuff like that today. But Genghis Khan like never sort of conquered India or had any intention to because he was more or less a Buddhist. And obviously Buddha, Buddhism yeah, was what prevalent. He did, if you remember what he actually did with China, I get it, he from absolutely yeah. the shit out of it. But he yeah. said to the powers that be at the top, what I will do is I think you actually run the place really well. I'm now your emperor and you'll run it exactly the same, but under my command. And yeah, yeah, yeah. now what that what that does for me, it's a, it's a control element of now I own your history, which he doesn't own Chinese history, but that's what he was saying at that point in time. And luckily enough, we've got so much. I mean, the Chinese are the best at documenting their history ever. And they're very, very strong. The problem is it's very difficult to get past a certain level with it. There's no way you can get past this like there's like a I've got good friends there, by the way. I actually know a journalist there, he's a good friend of mine on Twitter. A few friends that lect have lectured on Twitter with you and I actually. On spaces, a couple of friends that have come on. Oh, the cool. Yeah, and they're very open and honest but if you were to say mention i've got drone footage of the pyramids there bro like i'm i'm telling you i've got drone footage of it it's on video on my channel mention that drone footage and they're like we shouldn't have drones over now i know that but that's what i do i mention alternative view i do what other people aren't meant to do and uh, why should I do? Like and then, and then, all of a sudden, my t I did a whole series on China because of it. Because I got a little bit of a backlash. I was like, oh, "I'm liking this. I'm gonna fucking actually kill it now." And I did Yang Sham, Long Yu Caves. Um, I did the Terracotta Army, and I did uh, the drone footage of the pyramids. There, you know, it's still really tough to get 
any kind of access to anything to do with them pyramids. So an excursion that we should do one day, my brother, is we're going to China over the Himalayas. And I would love to do that bridge of the gap from India where we'll do India and then go up and over the Himalayas, mate, and have a bit of a butcher's and go into China. I I would love to do that with you, mate, if you're up for it. I know it'd be over a few holidays. I get it. We can't do it in a one. I know that. We'll have to do it a bit at a time. But I'd I'd like to do an India series with you. Like, we'll do, say, a few holidays and just do a really big series on this. I think we could really do well, mate. We could really do well. I'm completely down for it in every way, shape and form. Um, I think there's another place that might tickle your fancy because you mentioned about the Greeks. So in Kashmir, and obviously Kashmir is quite a quite a hotbed and has been quite a hotbed for religious occupation of, of that particular region for quite some time. Yeah. Um, and when you look at Kashmir and the surrounding regions of Jammu and Kashmir, there's yeah. ancient there's ancient like sort of temple sites that some are in disarray some are in reasonably good condition there's one that springs to mind now i can't remember the name of it off the top of my head i'll, I'll find it i'll send it to you when the when the podcast recording is all done and dusted um but at this particular site in kashmir outside this sort of central temple complex is a walkway and this walkway is domed with these massive basalt columns that look identical, identical to the Greek and Roman column designs. Now, when I saw this, when I saw this temple, and I have obviously never been there myself. Now, were they identical? Shown. What made them identical? In terms of their like, design. Do you mean, in as, in of, like, do you mean as in like the lintels and things like that? Yeah, so when you look at the Greek columns, they've got those divots inside them. They're circular and then obviously layering across the tops of the, <laughs> tops of the pyramid, a large, a large, um, a large sort of like, um, yeah. you know, marble beams, let's say, that sit atop, the, uh, sit atop them. This same layout in these, in these <laughs> columns, these Greek style columns, um, is in Kashmir at these, at these, at these, some of these ancient sites, but they're all made of basalt. But the Greeks never really mucked around with basalt, as far as I'm aware. They tended to lean in towards more softer rock and more softer materials, marble being yeah, obviously yeah. the most common one, and sandstone being another one, limestone obviously being another one of those. But they're all softer, more porous materials. Uh, marble obviously being a bit, a bit tougher than... Um, being slightly tougher than like sandstone and limestone as far as I'm aware. But anyway, the case in point is that when you look at these ancient sites in Kashmir, the fact that they show this design of what people say that those look like Greek columns, right? Well, what if, what if the Greeks adopted that design of these columns from somewhere even older, right? You talk about Alexander going into or trying to get into India, but like, you know, his sort of, adventures, intrepid adventures, exploration, his conquest across across the the Eurasian plateau or Europe, you know, Europe and China sit on the same continental plate. But that expansion of 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 the Greeks into Eurasia and then into Asia itself, maybe there was this adoption of this architecture because the Greeks weren't playing with basalt. They weren't carving basalt. But in Kashmir, there is ancient temple sites that are well and truly in the 5,000 plus BC range where they've been carved yeah, to look it, identical. I definitely, Dude, it's, it's crazy. I definitely think it was taken back from there. I think that knowledge. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it's as good a point as any. And maybe, maybe it slightly differs from that, but... It's definitely a good point, and it's a traversable road, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the new road, Silk Road, is what was used from, well, Gravitian times. Gravitian had that same expansion over the Himalayas. They were the ones that had it. I've done videos on it, mate. So it, it's, it's insane that that same progression continued 
somewhere in the line we've lost that i think alignments have changed as you know and uh, however the appropriate dangers on climate uh, are on us and i think that we haven't learned from the ancients what we should and i think look at the end of the day some of these rooms can help us out big time in knowing where to go what to do as a human race you know so yeah with that oh, i'm in complete agreement man with that on board my brother we've done uh uh however many hours it is that look i could talk to you all night mate, but what we will do <laughs> I do have work tomorrow, and you've probably got things to do. We'll we'll knock it on the air, yes. as in as a as a chat. But what I will say is, I could have talked to you all fucking night, mate. If you ever do want to have a really good chat, um, again, then we'll do that. But yeah, I'll knock it on the head. I know the girls are listening in here to see. Uh, I'm already here. Stuff. I'm already here. I've been listening for the last. Ah, uh, really? Is that yeah, okay, bro? Yeah, I'm okay. Let's I'm okay. On. Just not 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 in conditions to appear on camera, but, but I'm all right. You you'd be so impressed with what we've found and what Fozzie's found, mate. You, we've got to go to India. It's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been looking to the suggestion of Fozzie. I've been looking at uh, Martland Sun Temple. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, and yes. and I'm mesmerized by the strangeness of the structure i will send it to you uh, after phil i've got it i know it yeah, I've yeah. It. yeah i know it really well because it's it's and like it had water all around it as well you yeah know. yeah it's, and the columns are are massive it looks like a, a giant block of stone that was carved on itself instead of bringing the blocks and building the columns <laughs> In its original state as well, you imagine that water being there from an original underwater aquifer in the middle of a fucking desert. Do you understand me? Now, yeah. to, like, well, Fuzzy and I have discussed this. I don't know how long you've been there, Rick, but like, just oh, just twenty minutes. Okay, cool. Well, how long have these underwater aquifer? Well, we've we've discussed this in length this evening, but. Some of the, like Rick, honestly, in India, you know, like the hypergeums we've been talking about, times those by fucking, I'll scale them up by 50,000, mate. And it's coming from the sea. We've discussed rock cut mountains. It's like they, they were working out the hydrology, finding the mountain that they could get the archaeoacoustics correct with. Applying that through the mineralogy, then carving a temple above it, which like or or below it. Now that that gives so many fucking how the fuck, which we have discussed this evening, which has been brilliant, my I had. Probably one of the best discussions I've had in recent times. I'm really chuffed, man. And check this out, you know, behind the temples in um in India, they they're running, Rick. You remember our video where we were showing that the water was running into the individual temple sometimes three yes, weeks. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, in India, they're actually using that water and it's going behind the walls, and you've got the aquifer there. So, say you're inside and you whisper, that whisper reverberates like all around the room, mate, as a whisper. They were designing these rooms for communication, mate. I am fucking telling you, we were on it. We were on it. And what, no, what, not sure. what Fuzzy has got boots on ground actually backs us up huge. And it, within within the cave systems in India, which you'll find intriguing, more niche nubs everywhere. So acoustics, vibration technology, let's say, Let's say they were amplifying that. Say, I mean, in, in in essence, these game systems could have been huge hypergeums. Then they Absolutely. provide, then they provide the aquifer underneath the specific towns. You then give the pressure that you need to the buildings, and fucking boom! I get it that people could just say, "Oh, that's just like a water system for the." No, nah, it's not. Fuzzy was discussing like Rick on his knees, walking in rooms and going. Feeling of all, like feeling a big time all, and then yeah, yeah. I, I, I would even 
I'm not meant to be in here. I need mm -hmm. to get out. I was like, that's exactly what we've been talking yeah, about. I, I, I would like I would like to suggest to Fuzzy in your presence, if he's up to it, that he writes an addendum to our statement of significance on India with his perspective. If he give me the names of the temples that he's going to speak about, I can give him the papers so he can add on to his knowledge and he could write a whole addendum about India to our statement of significance. Yeah, then you can go on our paper and be remembered forever. <laughs> I guess... I guess it's probably now that, that, now that that specific thing has been raised, I have begun writing, uh, I guess I've begun writing this and typing, um, I guess sort of a observational like report and study on all my experiences in the caves. Um, and naturally it's going to have all the photos, it's going to have dimensions and it's going to, I mean, I've already begun to put in like a considerable amount of effort into this. I guess you want to call it a report. I'm already at like 5,000 words. I don't know how much more I'll put because there's so much to sort of discuss and I've tried to keep it as flowy and sort of relative as possible because these conversations, dude, like you can get lost in such, you can get lost in such a way. Like you can go down these like tiny little rabbit holes of, you know, yeah, these too specific much, too sort much. of subtopics. <laughs> It's 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 not the fact that it's just too much, but it's also like, you know, when we look at the average person that just wants to like sort of pick something up, read it and sort of understand it, if they don't have like an extensive knowledge of like how hydrology works or doesn't really have an extensive knowledge of geology or anything like that, like it can be quite overwhelming. Yeah, so you're I'm not going to get into it. This... into a puzzle fuzzy, are you? you need yeah, to correct. You know, every single... Well a lot of it from engineering to mineralogy to mm -hmm. hydrology to migration to the stone itself and how it was manipulated was the square cuts there all the hallmarks there what else was going on there was a communication where was the water how did they pump it in where did that go how was it controlled well you know like i have to and we have to all of us in this room look at that and every single question and actually know the answer around it now you can't learn that in a a single podcast you just can't and but it, deep sea diving at this point is like where we're at in the conversation obviously the podcast ended long ago like but this is kind of um the deep diving that we really needed to get to to well i i i personally think this has been a groundbreaking conversation well, i think I'm glad. I'm glad I could fill in some. So I hope I could fill in some blanks for you guys. So I said, I'm I'm purely just speaking to I'm just purely speaking to my personal observations. Like it's since being here, man, huge, like, mate, you've actually backed up every, and made it now even more for me here on the back of my neck. <laughs> so I, feel, I feel I feel like there's been a few answers given today. I, I, I whether it's the gods or whoever put us into place today, bro. Thanks for I'm just all glad I've got. Oh, I'm just glad I've got some Rick around it, Rick, and thank you to your girls as well that like for sorting this yes. out. I'm really chuffed that we got this off. Sure. I couldn't be here. Yeah, so thank I'm you. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. No oh, apologies, bro. That's all right. I, I can't wait. For you, you can listen. You can, you can listen during the edits. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. I Many times. Dude, yeah, it's been you're gonna, pleasure, you're, when you hear what we've found, you'll be like. It will be exactly the same as what you thought, but it, Fuzzy kind of his evidence backs up where we where we are massively, exactly. massive, massive. I, I mean, massively, like, and I was like, fucking hell, a few times today. The thing is, we we, we can we we we'll have the, to something here. Yeah, massive. We'll have the opportunity. Yeah. We'll have the opportunity to experience something close to what he finds in India. Because there is in Spain, by about five hours from here by car, uh, in Spain there is a place where is a small valley, where there is a church that supposedly holds the Holy Grail. But that's not the important. Yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. The important thing is the caves that are prehistoric, as a cult that are behind that spot. Because that's that's why they chose that those areas of telluric energies. So those caves are exactly as is shown in his videos and his images of India. 
is and people that go in there all have mystical experiences so it's We've a place talked that, about that today yeah quite a big level on um the experiences that foz has had when he's gone into places which has really intrigued me yeah. massively and the differences in uh, we've we've explained i've explained the institute's research which he knows as well but he actually kind of backed up with our them and, and you need to be on site to get them feelings yeah i don't think you're actually understanding like what they were going for Look, it, it's no accident that the templars took over the place because it was a, it was already a place of with um with a prehistoric art uh, he has sound capabilities proven and tested. Uh, just the mineralogy and the hydrology was never measured, but I think it's present also. Um, and um, and it's the, um, how should I say it? It's a place that we can actually go and visit because India is too far to pick up a car and, and, and go. But it's uh, it's the closest place with those same capabilities that I've seen is that that place in Spain and um, coincidence takes planning and the fact that it has been ruled by uh, religious occultists let's call it that since the the year about 800 of this era when they took the the ancients that lived there and controlled the the, the site because it was always a site of peregrination of meditation and so on the Templars got there, throw everyone out, put some monks in there controlling the cave, and only then, about 300 years later, they built the cathedral there, uh, which is strange because you see it's a church in the middle of nowhere. It's not, it's not serving any town or any village. It was built just for the effect of, from my perspective, of controlling those same energies, taking advantage of the the structure aligned to create acoustic effects so it's a place that we can visit. i'm, I'm very I'm prone to 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 go there as soon as i can and, and experience because i envy you that can you can go to india and visit all those sites and see them in person it's, it's, com it's completely different than watch a paper or, or watch a video or read a paper it's it's not yeah, the same thing. Really? It's, re it's really not dude like i said like i live here now so whenever you boys are ready next year we'll ready. set something up ready. I'll get me, some... me, 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 yeah me. dude <laughs> we'll sort it out man we'll get like a little traveler bus we'll just chart a map we'll just drive around dude. we'll literally drive around to all these sites bro because honestly like i think personally i think the best way to experience india is on the ground as opposed to just taking a plane from point a to point b because you tend to find on the major highways and freeways connecting where these major sites are, but, you know, it's sort of localized to larger cities that are sort of, you know, um, the major connecting hubs yeah. to these ancient sites. If you happen to take roads and highways and stuff like that to the areas, you'll actually come across, you'll actually come across a lot of cave systems that are there that haven't been explored. And there's, well and truly over a thousand cave systems that have been explored to some degree not obviously extensive in terms of like having their acoustic properties you know measured or any well, of that, that nature not just only that, bro they haven't been <laughs> they haven't been surveyed for quite how drastically huge they're going to be i think they interconnect everywhere all over india mate i'm not joking you yeah. everywhere no I, I, at least at least from as I said, well, the the cent, let's say the central, let's say, right, you know, the central part that you're talking about that connects, right? If we get to Tamil, which is never eat shredded wheat, it's like right in the middle of the bottom, and then that northern set of temples goes up to the Himalayas. I, I personally think that that line there was your circle of occupation of badasses. Uh, they knew how to go forward to the side. They had everything controlled there. And I think it was an amount of temples. I think you, you weren't looking at a castle control in a city. You were looking at a fucking vast amount of temples controlling an area, a massive one. I don't know what mm -hmm. fucked it. 
because I'm telling you, it looks to me like that circle there was special. And I, I, look, we can prove it. We can prove it. We can go and do the frequency testing. If we go to specific temples on that line that I've just told you about, and we take on that t results from there, there, and there, if we find frequencies that match each other, we know fucking well that we are bang on where we where we should be right now, and that advances us further than anybody on the planet. Sure, right. I have well, no doubt I, that... I, that I, the, the I, I, I think we're on it here. I, I'm really fucking happy. Yeah. I'm do the test. sure that you can create a matrix like... And, and Fuzzy will tell me if this has happened. I never checked it, but I'm pretty sure that if you create a grid, including all the temples that you are aware of, you will find that they create some sort of a matrix that covers the whole area of the continent. I think so too. Yeah. And okay. Yes, to I, I agree somewhat. Obviously, I haven't gone extensive in my research on the eastern side of India. As we've got, to the we've got like, uh, mate, serious before you even go there. We've just we've got some maps and we'll show you. Don't worry about. Oh, I can't wait. You will yeah, yeah. Oh, move what we're about to show you. We'll make your research come together as well. Oh, you can you can you can see it. It's yeah. called it's called the Catalan map. The you Catalan can, we map. Have, yeah. yeah, we have a we have a What's video it shows them all adjoined. It's the one I told you about on the episode the thirteen seventy five. Look, our research our it's research on it. Yeah, took us to strange places. You were talking about Geng Genghis Khan just a few minutes ago. Uh, yeah. And and we According to historical records, that are not recognized as facts, but as fictional history. But to me, they are history. After all, they motivated what it's called um, the discovery era of the sea in the 1500s. They were not looking for India. That's bullshit. And that's historical. Mm. They were looking mm. for Prester John's country. Why? Because it was a Caucasian that had built an entire uh, uh, empire in, in the Middle East, somewhere between Africa and India. And Fuzzy, check it. He had the, he, he, this is written. He turned up in different eras at different points. Remember that boy? Yeah, 600 boy years, at least. 600 years. Remember that little boy I told you about? Yeah. Gray? Yeah. Now, now think about Preston John. So, how does he turn up at different points in history? He could have and different, and in different, However, in different places. If, if the archaeoacoustics and you could use them. So, mineralogy of stone. Now, look at this. Now, you see, you need to look at mineralogy in your mind. So, we're activating these sites, and uh, the stones are vibrating to the point that the site becomes active. Okay. Mm. Preston John promotes that he was able to go from site to site through a site so he could walk through it. Now, before you shun that idea, Groparello Castle, you've got a gate. You've got what's called a photographic vortex. You change a camera, you can take a picture, and you can see that it's there. That, that was to test whether you had the correct frequency to walk into Groparello, period. You're either going to get a feeling of awe or you're going to get a feeling of get the fuck out. Families battled mm -hmm. over Well, it was two families that battled over it for a very, very long time. I've, I've told you earlier on what was underneath it. It was a hypogee of flowing water. Mm -hmm. this place, and the tower above. This place is one of our castles, mate. But it's it seems a later built version it could be our builders but before they're gone you yeah know it was it? transformed it was transformed by the romans amplified Preston even John was roaming from building to building fuzzy he was able to go building to building yeah look the, an interesting fact that he was commissioned yeah. he was commissioned by alexander the great and this is not recognized mm. by historians but it is in the same books with the stories that they recognize as real. Okay. Done a lot of this, by the way, mate, this isn't hearsay. We've done a fuck yeah. load on this. So, so Alexander the Great commissioned, uh, asked the favor because there was no one above him, asked the favor of Preston John to create the technology through towers with these hypogeums to 
keep the citizens from the land of Gog and Magog without entering the territory of, of what was the Mongols. So the, the precursor of the entire wall of China were these towers with hypogeums that create a frequency that didn't allow animals, the giants, anyone to pass through them and enter the land. So there was no violence needed. There was no weapons, no security guards. I don't guards, feel like this. The nothing. feeling of war, the feeling of fear with the armies coming near anywhere. If you got to that set of woods, do you remember? Yeah, it's like about that? two, two to four hertz, and you lose. Um, it's an you, lose you lose the, the motor control. Yeah, you lose the motor control. You get disorientated. You, start well, you, know yourself, you spoke to me in detail about the mind and how it works. You and I spoke about psychedelics. You also know how it's easy to, as a control factor to work. A set of people, if magnetics and archaeoacoustics are involved and you are able to give them, remember that seeing an F chord feeling that health? What if you were to able to give that serotonin level a feeling of awe? So all your people were feeling fine and all the people around you that were coming to you were thinking, I can't go anywhere near there. We could have ran in harmony for thousands of years. Like you mean you have said, what happened? Well, for thousands of years, we could have run perfectly well. And then for some reason, a water connection, as simple as that, remember? Mm -hmm. You want to destroy this battlefield, you block up the water. Zaya mm -hmm. Aaron Lan. We talked about the RAF base. Mm -hmm. We've talked about how many temples that you know were destroyed by the Muslim armies that mm -hmm. basically would have had ent entrances only to the aquifers underneath, which doesn't mean they're destroyed at all. And they wouldn't have destroyed the aquifers. So what, what India's done well is the subterranean levels are very well protected at this point. Generally speaking, yeah, generally speaking, they are. So for me, it's probably the most functional place on the planet still that's got active water. I don't think of anywhere, unless there's any other suggestions, that is of ornate magnitude that would give us the correct testing. I really do. If, you've got, if I go into somewhere in a room and I feel that feeling of, wow, I feel good in it, and I need just the frequencies in there and I'm feeling better and better and better, feeling worse and worse and worse. We fucking know we're on it. We know we're on it. Um, and it's a simple test. It's not hard. This isn't rocket science. Then we can start going to town with the testing guys. Do you know what I mean? We can go everywhere. Functional yeah, lines everywhere. I think it's, it's not found because it's, although it's very complicated, it's too simple. It's too hard for a scientist to believe that you introduce certain f sound or frequency into a building and no, the building I, will I do all the rest. I what anyone believes, Rick. Yeah. I'm not in this for scientists. Or, I, I want to get my boots on ground. Let me just conclude this to Fuzzy. And Preston John only ended, his, his empire only ended because the father of Genghis Khan wanted to marry his daughter. And he refused. So he attacked him by uh, backstabbing him. So because the, the, the fact is the Mongols was called the Tartarians and the Tartarians were the workforce of Preston John. Everything you see Tartarian buildings, they were the workforce of Preston John. That was his influence. That's why he could reach any court in Europe and be received as an above the king. So the few times that he appears in historical records, yeah. he doesn't even travel. He appears inside the building. So, for instance, he, he Fuzzy, appeared... Fuzzy, he's so correct here, and we'll, we'll, we'll digress just a little bit on that. It was to that much of an extent that everybody knew he was there. And it's written that the world that he was protecting was a utopia, and it mentions animals that we, we don't know. I'm not joking. Yeah, we do, sure. we do, but they're they're mentioned mythologically. Absolutely. So was he was he true or was he not? Or are we? Uh, I mean, look, when you look at places like you know, Preston John was obviously prominent in Ethiopia. When you look at like if you look at um, if you look at the 
very first version of Oxford Dictionary, the very first version from like 1820, somewhere there. In, the, in that Oxford Dictionary, it references unicorn and bicorn. And when you look up in that dictionary, unicorn, it goes into another page and references rhinoceros. And when you look up rhinoceros, it translates it to unicorn. And then you can look at bicorn, and that also translates to rhinoceros as well. I'm not obviously saying that unicorns. That. That's I, amazing. Yeah, yeah, dude, you can go look at the very first version of the Oxford Dictionary refers to rhinoceroses. I as, did not like, know that. And that is fucking yeah. amazing. What a that fact. Is, yeah, Let me show you this, Fuzzy. So you understand what I'm saying. Uh, to the you know, yeah. Do you, let me tell you. Tell me oh. if you're seeing the image. Oh. Uh, it's just loading now. Yes, I can see it now. Okay. You know what this is? Uh, it looks like some sort of cathedral mural, maybe at the top of a door no, no. or some this, sort this, of archway. This, this here. Can you see my mouse? Oh, where the this figures here. are? Yeah, yeah. That. Yes, yes, it looks like, I mean, my brain goes to some sort of cathedral. Okay, this is the symbol for the country of Preston John. That's what appears in the maps. Oh. And this is on a monastery in Portugal from the 1300s. On the doorway. I'm going to show you the doorway. Just Give me just a second. Give me just... Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, man. I'm already locked in. Hola. What's happening? Uh, Ricardo's showing and showcasing some images. I'm not sure where this one's specifically from, but it's got a lot of he's saying that the going on. Yeah, he's there, saying that central. Work. So oh, I, right. I I haven't told this to Phil. Do you see this, Phil? Do you yeah. see my mouse? Yeah. Okay, this is, you know this, this is the symbol for Preston John country. Yeah. That's what appears in the map. Do you remember on the Catalan yeah, map? Yeah, it's gorgeous, mate, yeah. Okay, this is in the in the monastery from the 1300s in Portugal that is called Mosteiro da Batalha. So I'm going to show you what the building is. Uh, how do I do it? Like this. Where is this? It's here. So... This is the kind of Tartarian work done. Do you see how the symbols are hidden? I'm going to show you from the other side. Look, how they hide them. Wow. I have a better one, just a second. I took a hundred photos. Here it is. You see, nothing special. Then you, you zoom in and you have the temple Templar cross, because this is a Templar yeah. building, and then the kings that allow them to build and give them the land. Everything is incorporated and everything is full with these strange towers. Look, look at this. Those this, strange this is all for sound, just for sound. You know how high is the navel inside? It's These 30 dude, meters. Those strange high. towers, those strange towers that you look mentioned in look in Nasik. Whoa. Dude, I'll send you guys. I'll send. I'll send that, the photo. Look I'll what's on top. Right look what's on top. Press and John. Beneath the dragon, uh, above the dragon, which means the highest. Oh, this is stuck. Look, this is 30 meters high. Why? Why does it have to be 30 meters high?
I'm going to send you guys a photo. Um, I want to send you guys a photo real quick. So let me get it. Uh, what I'm now finding while we look for it is that real or not, Preston John is has a signature in everything that we find there is from the Templars beyond. So they're like the reformists, the ones that came and bring the world out of the pagan, but take all the sites the pagan used because that's where the energies is are and use this technology to enhance the this kind of energies. It is all linked with that theory that all the, the bells of the churches were changed in the 1800s because of the hypnotistic powers they had. And those that remain, the towers where they are, were dismantled so that, that the sound is no, is, it's free. It's not condensed in, in, into specific areas. And another thing that I discovered this week is that the, the church organs, the pipe organs, do create infrasound, which I thought they didn't, but they do. <clears throat> I just sent you guys both photos. Um, yeah. So this this on on Twitter. Um, okay. So these photos these photos are from the site in Nasik called the Trimbakeshwar Jotaling, which is one of the most ancient sites in India, one of the most revered sites in India, the Jotalingas. Um, and outside the Jotaling, which in the first photo you'll see is the actual main sort of complex. I'm, we're looking at this from the from the northern side, but next to the temple is the this, same is, this is this pillar tower. It's identical to it's yeah. identical to those towers. Exactly. Um, I is. don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it's for. I asked a few people. I asked a few locals about it, and they said that it's used to hold candles. Now it was rebuilt because, un unfortunately, Aurangzeb sent his Mughal Empire to destroy the Jotaling. Um, and they actually managed to destroy some of it. It was mainly like picking apart the blocks as a, like sort of dismantling the place brick by brick as opposed can, to- Can like, I make sense of that? Can, can I make sense of that? Of what, this particular tower, this no, pillar? No, of they destroying those, those elements. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what was taken. All I know is that that no, entire No, no, they site... was destroyed because Genghis Khan or his successors, but mainly him, knew the technology. He knew you had to destroy these places first in order to conquer the country. Because if one remembers how to put it to work, he couldn't go in. They knew the technology. Okay. They... Well, I, I don't know with India so much. I mean, obviously there was Mongol invasions later only the to the north only to, to like, the north yes only to the correct north. correct correct but this this site's definitely not this site would definitely not be considered north and these these towers they're actually littered around nasik which is the place where i first went to to see my first set of caves the nasik caves and it, these aren't just at this jotalin these are actually in the city of nasik as well they're just randomly strewn near this river um, so I'm yeah, not really sure what that function is. Yeah, I, I, and this this site, this Jotaling site, this site sits on top of an underground aquifer and sits adjacent <laughs> to two rivers, sits adjacent to two rivers that run okay. up into the mountains. And when you look at the mountain line, this massive plateau, and I zoomed in on my camera, you can actually see the entrances or exits to cave systems that are up in the mountains where where water would come out and go down the mountains and fill in these basins that would then run into the into further basins and and rock cut channels that surround and sit under the the actual temple site and this is the same at all these drop links it's it's identical but I, I this is the only place that i've seen these pillars so it's very interesting that you show photos of that because yeah they do look quite identical in many respects so maybe there is some evidence of the ancient tartarian civilization that may have had some cross-cultural implications into different parts of the planet I, I i wouldn't be surprised dude like to be completely honest with you you simply just need to look at iconography in the shared look the shared knowledge of iconography across can, the can't you like see 
as an example. Can't you see those same towers on Angkor Wat, for instance? Uh, I haven't looked too much. I've looked at some stuff of Angkor Wat, but uh, look, to be honest, like a lot of these, a lot of these sites that I revere so much, I really want to. I will see them in person eventually. All of them I'll see in person, but I haven't done too much, too much deep diving into Angkor Wat. I know that Angkor Wat has has a relationship with water, um, and I know that Angkor Wat is is magnetically aligned. And I know that Angkor Wat has some very, very unique acoustic properties, but all the footage that I've ever truly looked at is only from like a handful of guys like Praveen Mohan, obviously being like, uh, you know, sort of one of the major yeah, ones yeah. of my sort of knowledge acquisition of that particular site. But most of my stuff, dude, most yeah, of the things we, that we, for we, me have been more of observational experiences. We had a slight, a slight advance in the academics uh, towards our way because they just found a certain number additional number of water deposits handmade gigantic mm. deposits and mm. now what they thought that were fields to be harvested and that they, the water was for agriculture now they realize that the water it's not for agriculture so mm. they don't know what the water was for the fact is you won't mm. find anywhere else in anywhere else in the world a place that has as much water in reservoirs as Angkor Wat. The ones with the ones that they just found now, they are just massive, 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 all to feed one temple. Okay. And let's not all, forget. It's easy. All. So the communication from there would have been monumental. Yeah, the amplification, those towers in the central structure that yeah. are like pine cones stretched to the heavens. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can, you, I mean, with a bright mind, you can almost look over the maps, what we've told you to look at, Fuzzy, and see this working. So now, I'd look, look, the functionality of it all is down to where these aquifers, subterranean levels, hypergeums are actually working. And that's where we have to wait as teams. You know, in our lifetime, we need to document those results so then next generation can move forward and fucking activate it if we can't you know yeah it's been an honor fuzzy i've uh, really enjoyed today and thanks ever so much for coming to the institute for natural philosophy thanks for chatting to myself i think we've had great fun and what will be edited onto this and uh yeah i look forward to it uh, let's get in boot on ground and doing some more work mate if i'm brutally honest so <clears throat> great conversation and uh yeah, really, really thought we broke some boundaries today. I really enjoyed today. It's been a great day. So thank you, yeah. mate. Yeah, kudos. No, well, catching up again. Don't be a stranger if you need me. You know where I am. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. I'll thank you guys because you guys gave me the platform to actually finally have a conversation about these things. And it's been, yeah. you know, it's oh, been a, it's been a journey just for myself, man, to sort of go around to these sites and it's one thing just to document you know these things yourself and sort of put them up on youtube or whatnot but to actually like sit down and have an extensive discussion about the sort of findings and the observations about these things has been a real treat for me so once again thank you guys for giving me the platform no, absolutely if you if you want to promote it. anything if you have anything to promote your channel anything just do it yeah sure so um yeah it's simply the same handle is across um my twitter account or my x account sorry um instagram and youtube it's simply fozzy the aussie of f-o-z-z-i-e t-h-e-a-u-z-z-i-e um and that's the same across across all my socials um and yeah i've got videos up on youtube which you know i've sort of documented my experiences in some of these caves um and then my exit can is where i sort of you know put most of the stuff up and and my instagram um so if anyone you know sort of likes this material and wants to see where it sort of goes please give me a follow you know sort of send me a message if you're you're interested if people are in india and want to meet up somewhere and go check out some ancient sites hit me up i'd be more than down but um yeah mm -hmm. thank you guys and I, I, yeah, absolutely i, I can't you. wait to show you guys around india oh, i man. truly can't oh, man. man i know it'll be a blessed time Thank you very much.